Okay, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the S September 16th uh, meeting of the Los Banos City Council. Could I please have George Allen from Westside Church come forward for the opening prayer? Um, I would like to express my thanks for the continuing support of the Christian churches in this community by continuing to invite prayer at these proceedings. Thank you. As we pray, think of this. We will be entering into the very throne room of God. Let us pray. Dear Father, on our own we are not able to come up with answers for our problems that continue to plague us in our country, in our state, and in our city. And so we recognize that without your help, we can do nothing. Please help us. We pray for our city and all its decisions to, to spend or to not spend, to apply wisdom to those things that we, would, we will be discussing tonight. We pray, we pray for our mayor, along with the city council members, and those that are that are hired to serve our city with our trust in them to do the, uh, to the, do the job we ask. We pray for our police and its departments. They carry a fiduciary responsibility to uphold justice and all, and all the while they need to go home to their families safely. We pray for their safety. We pray for all those who would do business here to have the best construction on all projects and to be honest in all their dealings with our community. We pray for discovery. We pray for revelation. Show us those things that we might be missing so that we can serve with knowledge and foresight. Finally, as a community, help us all to pray for rain. Bring down your blessings on us, even though we are not worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, George. I'd like to call to order the September 16th meeting of the Los Angeles City Council. And Commander Hedden, would you... Oh, Chief Breezy. All right, Commander Hedden, you just popped in. Would you please lead us in the flag salute? Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay. Director Malady, roll call. Berea? Here. <coughs> Lewis? Here. Silvera? Here. Stonegrove? Here. Peralta? Here. We have a quorum. Let's go on to item four. Consideration of approval of agenda. Do I have a motion? Mr. Freya. I'll move to approve the agenda as submitted. Mrs. Lewis. I'll second the motion. Motion by Freya, second by Lewis to approve the agenda as stated. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Item five, presentation, proclamation recognizing Cancer Awareness Month. And could I have the fire department come forward, please? Everyone that's here. don't have a final total yet, but these gentlemen, along with the, uh, the rest of the fire department, have, uh, have uh, put forth their time, their volunteerism, to raise money again for cancer awareness this month, and we will have a uh, final total later on, later on, probably. So if you guys, uh, if you three would turn your backs on the crowd for a minute, and I'll turn mine. Uh, these are the shirts that we're selling. Last year they were pink, and now they're a little bit more uh, neutral, uh, let's see, gender neutral for male and female. We still have the pink? Okay, thank you. <laughs> it kind of got me out of wearing the tie tonight, so I kind of like it. <laughs> Proclamation recognizing Cancer Awareness Month. 
Whereas, according to the American Cancer Society, in 2015, about 1,658,370 new cancer cases are expected to be diagnosed and approximately 589,430 Americans are expected to die of cancer, making cancer the second most common cause of death in the United States, according to nearly one out of every four deaths in America. Cancer Awareness Month emphasizes the importance of prevention and early detection through health screenings as well as the promotion of healthy lifestyles including proper diet, exercise, and smoke-free environment. Cancer Awareness Month honors the memory of those we have lost, supports those that are still fighting cancer, and celebrates the survivors who inspire us through their strength and courage. And whereas the City of Los Banos recognizes the month of October as Cancer Awareness Month, a time to join together to battle all cancers to raise awareness and to send a message that ending all cancers must be the national health priority. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the mayor and the city council members of the city of Los Banos do hereby proclaim October as Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Los Banos and ask the citizens of Los Banos to wear pink and in an effort to raise awareness, to celebrate survivors and to encourage those in the treatment of cancer. Our whole community, if you can, purchase these shirts. They are $15 to the fire department. This will help. This money goes directly to for cancer research. Uh, last year, a tremendous amount of money was raised, and uh, we are just so pleased that our fire department has taken their time to help with this such a worthy cause and all the rest of the people of Los Banos who with the cancer runs, the cancer awareness, the groups, the support groups that they have. It's not just the fire department and everyone that's fighting cancer in this community. Thank you all for everything that you've done and please continue because this needs to be wiped out. It's our number one concern, wiping out cancer for everyone in the world, not just Americans, everyone in the world. Thank you so much, gentlemen. very much. On behalf of Los Banos Professional Firefighters Association, IAFF Local 37, 3703, I'd like to thank you very much for this proclamation. Again, this is something that's really dear to all of us. Uh, we've joined up once again with Pink Heels to bring awareness to Los Banos, and we encourage everybody in our community to please come out and join our fundraiser and support us by wearing pink in the month of October. We still have shirts available. Uh, you can buy them from Fire Station down on uh, 7th Street. Uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to Mary Lou. But we do need all funds in by September 18th so that we can have them available for you to pick up by the 5th of October. If you have any questions, again, Mary Lou Gilardi uh, at 827-7025. Thank you very much. Also, on the October 7th, help us celebrate the 125th year anniversary of this fire department. 125 years, and our paid staff have not been on that long. It's been mostly volunteerism for the majority of the 125 years. And with, with members of the city, with the volunteers, they help to save so many lives in our community and we're going to give them a special recognition next uh, in two weeks, October 7th. And Tim, would you please bring that fabulous video that was shown at the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the plaza when we had the, um, uh, the movie in the park? And uh, if you could bring an engine over and, and maybe people could view that a little bit early. So please help us celebrate 125 years of a wonderful organization and a very caring and selfless organization. Thank you so much.
Okay, let's go on to item six, public forum. Members of the public may address the City Council on any item of public interest that is within the jurisdiction of the City Council, which includes agenda and non-agenda items. No action will be taken on non-agenda items, and speakers are limited to a five-minute presentation. Detailed guidelines are posted on the Council Chamber informational table. When you approach the podium, please state your name and city of residence. And I would remind you, if you have cell phones, please turn them off or place them on vibrate. Thank you. Is there anyone who, wants to speak, who would like to speak at the public forum? Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, Community. I'm Sandy Lemus. I live in Los Banos. Bonnie Roberts and I live in Los Banos. And we are here on the behalf of Salvation Army. I know that you guys are aware of who we are. And we're here to stay. Okay, and we run about uh, 3,500 people a week, I mean a month through that center, and it takes a lot of funds to do that. And it's all um, from donations, and we have a big fundraiser coming up on October the 12th. It's our um, second annual golf, or third annual golf tournament, and this last summer we sent um, um, over 60 kids to camp. And... Um, Either you, we deal with them now and send them camp, or he's going to get them. And I'm pointing to our police chief. So uh, please come out and support us. It's a. Uh, I, I have the. If you want to pass those out to each one of them, please. Okay. Would you just hand him, give him yeah. to the city clerk, please? Yeah, give him the city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's going to be a great time. We've got. Uh, um, it's at uh, Pheasant Run Golf Course in Chowchilla. I don't know if you've ever played it. I uh, played it once, and it's uh, my brothers play it. It's a really good course. Um, we're also gearing up for um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, our bell ringing. Uh, we need volunteers for bell ringing. If you will please just uh, come in, um, come to 1231 Fourth Street, or at eight two seven four nine four five if you want to volunteer to ring the bell. Or if you have kids, grandkids, neighbors, anybody that you want to, uh, uh, to ring the bell. We start this year um, before Thanksgiving, before uh, we hadn't been allowed to start till afterwards, but now they say we can. And uh, we've lost one spot, Kmart, so that'll be kind of hard for us, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be made up. Our other one is fill the truck for toys. That's at, um, we're partnering with Walmart, and it will only be on um, the weekend of November the 27th, the last week in November, the first week in December, and the second week in December. And it is a receptacle that will be inside Walmart at the west end of the building where the vegetables are, and then it disperses off. It will be there. There will be somebody manning it, and all you have to do is just drop the toy in there and uh, coat or whatever it is. Uh, but we're looking forward to a great season this season. Uh, we know that um, um, this town is a giving town uh, for us, and just uh, come, and, come and sponsor us. Come and see. And if you haven't been to the Salvation Army, please come and visit us. Come and see what we do down there. Okay? We're good people. Okay? You are good people. So that was Bonnie's five minutes. Now yeah. it's my five minutes. <laughs> we'll be real Actually, quick. We'll be no. Real quick. No? No. <laughs> but I was going to talk about some other stuff. Uh, well, uh, other than Salvation Army? Well, well sort of. Uh, <laughs> kind well, of. Cancer, a cancer awareness. Uh, I, okay, uh, I'll come back. Okay, that would be better. Oh. <laughs> you help me out. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Eric Lamont, resident of Los Banos, employee for public services. Uh, good, e good evening, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Mayor and respected right. council Didn't member. I? Um, I would like to inform our residents yeah. about the annual fall cleanup hosted by the city of Los Banos and Republic Services. The event will be held Saturday, September 26, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. Bring all your unwanted items you can't place into your regular garbage or green waste containers for free disposal. 
Uh, green waste must be separated from other materials. Car tires will be accepted, nine tires maximum. Any more than that, the state of California requires you to, to obtain a tire hauler permit. Batteries will be accepted, car and truck only. Electric wa electronic waste will also be accepted, such as TVs, computers, computer parts, DVD, VCR players, and cell phones. Household hazardous waste materials will not be accepted at this event. This includes paint, chemicals, household batteries, and medical waste. You can recycle your used motor oil by placing uh, up to two gallons of oil and two oil filters in a sealed container along your recycle cart on your service day. If you have questions on how to dispose of hazardous waste materials, please contact Merced County Associations of Governments at 826-1163. Um, I want to encourage our residents and commercial business to continue to recycle to help our state-mandated diversion goal of 75% by the year 2020. If you need assistance in implementing a recycling program for your home or business, please contact me at 826 Eric Lamone, 826-0231. Uh, Cal Recycle is very pleased with our city's efforts in our recycling, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, thank you guys and have a great night. And recycling days are again? Um, September 26, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. September 26, 7 a.m. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Um, uh, Merced County Spring Fair parking lot. Okay. So, on the corner of F and 4 streets. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Wait a minute. Let me reset here. Sure. Okay. You can start now. Thank Hi. you. Hi. My name is Leah Ramirez and I live in Los Banos. I would like to request that the City Council place uh, backyard chickens on the agenda for next month. Um, our society is becoming increasingly troubled by the economy, the environment, food safety, animal welfare, and emergency preparedness. Many of us want to strive to become more self-reliant. We are now learning that what past generations already knew, that gardening, canning food, and raising chickens for eggs are greatly beneficial. There are a few people who are against having backyard chickens, and it's usually because they have not been properly educated as to the benefits. Some of the more common complaints are noise, smell, rodents, disease, and property value. I would like to address each and every one of these complaints one by one. One, noise. Roosters are the main source of noise that people are typically complaining about. If you don't have roosters, chickens aren't noisy, and my request has nothing to do with roosters, just hens. While hens do cluck and peep softly during the day, they go to bed at dusk and remain quiet all night. One of the many advantages of keeping backyard chickens is for the benefits of having an endless supply of farm fresh eggs. Solution? You do not need a rooster to enjoy farm fresh eggs every morning. In fact, hens will lay better if there is no rooster around to disturb their routine. A good city chicken law will not allow for roosters. Two, smell. Yes, chickens can smell just like dogs, cats, rabbits, hamsters, gerbils, and even people if not taken care of properly. We are not talking about a 300-foot commercial chicken house with 30,000 chickens next door. We are talking about 6 to 12 haying lens, laying hens in a backyard setting. The chickens themselves do not smell. It's only their feces that has the potential to stink. For example, a flock of six hens hens weighs less than 30 pounds and generates less waste than one average dog. Chicken manure is a highly valued fertilizer that can be used in the garden. Dog and cat manure can't because of the parasites and human diseases it can harbor. This is where crafting a good chicken law comes into play. If the law only allows chickens in a well-maintained coop, then a chicken owner with a messy, filthy, smelly coop is out of compliance and can be cited under the law. Three, will having chickens in my backyard attract rodents? Some claim that keeping chickens will attract mice and rats and other unwanted pets. If you think you don't already have these outside your home, you are mistaken. Everyone does. This is an agriculture town with a mixture of farming plots and suburban homes. As with any other pets and their food, such as dog food, cat food, and bird feeders, these two will attract unwanted, ro unwanted rodents and pests if you aren't properly containing the food. So having backyard chickens would fall under that same category and require the properly containment of feed. Four, aren't chickens considered livestock? The definition of livestock is farm animals raised as an asset. Chickens are a dual purpose animal, raised for profit or treated like pets. Hens are small, harmless, friendly, entertaining, and easy to care for. Six small hens aren't livestock any more than a vegetable garden is a farm. Five, do chickens carry diseases? Backyard chickens are quite healthy and have less disease than your average dog or cat. While there's a possibility of mites or salmonella, you have a greater chance of getting sick from eating spinach from a grocery store than you will from your neighbor's chickens. Six, will chickens help or hurt the economy? Through research, it has been noted that egg-laying hens have not created a financial burden for cities that allow chickens, nor has it spurred um, fighting among neighbors, nor presented a noise, odor, or rodent problem, or reduced property values, or posed a public health threat. In fact,
Public officials in cities where backyard chickens have been permitted for years view it as beneficial community building and self-sustaining activity that they promote and encourage. Las Banas can gain income from issuing reasonable annual licenses and collecting fines from owners who don't comply with the ordinance. Also, there are many feed and pet stores in town that would benefit from new pet owners. While I have just countered the typical negative perspectives, here are some of the many positive aspects of keeping backyard chickens. Chickens boast environmental, educational, and nutritional benefits other pets cannot. They provide chemical-free pest control, eliminate disease-transmitting insects, control weeds, and produce valuable nitrogen-rich fertilizer. They are a living lesson to children that food does not originate in the supermarket freezer section in nugget form. Chicken keepers view their coops, flocks, and yards as a source of pride, landscaping, decorating, and tending to their cleanliness fastidiously. They can provide food security for poor families. They lay healthier eggs compared to store-bought eggs, and on average, a hen produces a quarter pound of valuable garden fertilizer daily. They control flies and other pests not add to them, and dispose of weeds and chicken scraps that otherwise might end up in the landfill. Please pass a sensible regulation that encourages families to grow their own food. Members of the City Council, I urge you to consider amending the current, or current ordinance to allow for backyard chickens. I have circulated a petition on change Org, and we are several hundred strong and growing. Hundreds of Los Banas citizens have joined in the fight to legalize chickens in our community, and I am hopeful after hearing my arguments for this cause, you will grant my petition to revise the ordinance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Can I, I, I would like to outline the procedure for you, though. We can't this body right now cannot accept to say that we're going to put this on an agenda because it's an ordinance and it has to go through the planning commission and it also has to go through our city staff. So if you would please, as a favor to me, give the city clerk your name and phone number. Okay, and then we will have someone from the city contact you. And if you'd like to bring a few representatives, we'll have a, the, uh, the, the, the city person, I think, is probably going to fall on the police chief and the city manager. And, uh, and that will be the first step. Okay? Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Yeah, come on back. <laughs> I'll come up with a new name. <laughs> I'm Sandy Lemus. I'm still from Las Banas, and I'm going to talk about some other issues. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, commend the fire department for doing the cancer awareness services. A lot of people were not aware that I actually went through cancer treatment last year for breast cancer. Um, when I was going through chemo, unfortunately, uh, my husband and son put me under house arrest, um, and I could not leave the house under any circumstances because they didn't want me to get germs. But um, it's, it's wonderful all the community support, uh, how much people help, and I really uh, thank the fire department for going above and beyond. Um, there's a, a wonderful cancer awareness event coming up in Turlock. It's put on by Emanuel Cancer Center, which is where I got my treatment. It's actually, uh, the fire department's involved, and I would love to get one of these uh, programs going here. Amy, somebody from Good, Ameri Good Morning America, What's her name? Amy. Amy somebody from Good America is going to be the speaker. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful event. And I would love to get that event here um, because people really need to be aware. And um, a side issue with breast cancer is breast cancer is increasing in men. So you do need to uh, be aware of that and uh, be aware of your body and do checks. Um, also, another side issue, the Hope Center, we're expanding our services. We are launching a GED preparation program starting October 1st. Uh, Portrait of California was issued by United Way of Merced County, and they kind of divided the county in half, and we have a 37.4% uh, adults that do not have their diploma. We have a very unskilled labor force, so we really need to um, help these people get their GEDs. If anybody would like information, we can uh, provide transportation resources, we can pay for the GED test, they can get a hold of me at 826-5648. I did not give you the Salvation Army number because I'm not, we already used up our time, so you can call me at my home for that information. Thank you. Jim's going Jim's to love this. As for Jim Lemus, 826-5648. <laughs> Okay, and we're ready to go. They can come in early if they'd like, and we've already gotten a good response. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum?
Hello, Bertha Faria, Los Banos Chamber of Commerce. Come and visit downtown Los Banos on Saturday as we hold our annual Fall Street Fair from 8.30 to 3 p.m. We have vendors, entertainment, pony and train rides for the kids. On Saturday evening, you can join the Los Banos Arts Council for their first concert of the season with Hook Slide beginning at 7.30. And the Los Banos Seroptimist are now accepting applications for their Live Your Dream Award. This program offers cash grants to women who are working to better their lives through additional schooling and skills training. And for application information, you can call Barbara at 509-9664. We welcome JNN Restaurant to membership with the Chamber. This new restaurant is located downtown at 933B 6th Street and offers breakfast and lunch. They hope to extend to dinner hours in the near future and will be scheduling a grand opening and a ribbon cutting soon. We are nearing our final plans on the 2015 Tomato Festival and invite the community out to this admission-free event on Saturday, October 3rd. Opening, opening ceremonies with the flag raising from our local veterans will begin at 10 a.m., followed by a day filled with food, contest, music, and demonstrations. And I have a brief comment on item number eight, number two. We at the Chamber would request that the City do all it can to support and promote community events as it has in the past. Please take into consideration as you review the fees for the Special Events Ordinance the cost prohibitive factor that our organizations will now have to consider as they plan their annual events, both great and small. What often makes a community is those organizations that take it upon themselves to provide positive community building events. Those events that give our residents a quality of life and a sense of place. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Hi, I'm Donna Mendes. I am president of the Las Banas Downtown Association. I'm also a business owner on 6th Street. Um, so I, I wrote uh, Mayor and City Council a letter and I thought I would just come and read it to you instead of emailing it to you. But before I do that, I also wanted to just um, let everyone know we, um, what we're doing for the Downtown Association in October is we're having our Scarecrow uh, contest. Each business last year had a scarecrow in front of their business and the general public got to vote as many times as they wanted to uh, what their favorite scarecrow was. It was just something to bring just some happiness to downtown and um, this year we're going to do it again and it'll be like the whole month of October up until Halloween. And we're also adding this year um, that the businesses have an option of doing scarecrows or witches. So we hope everyone would come out and vote for that. It's, it just decorates the downtown it's, and it makes it festive. So I wanted to read this letter um, to Mayor Villalta and the Las Banas City Council. Um, I'm writing to you on behalf of the Las Banas Downtown Association in regards to establishing a better partnership between the City of Las Banas and the Las Banas Downtown Association. The Downtown Association and the Downtown Merchants are trying very hard to keep our historic downtown lovely and thriving. In the past few years, most of the merchants have worked together to maintain and keep our storefronts clean and eye appealing. This includes keeping city sidewalks and tree beds maintained as best as we can. We were asked by the city to help them out due, due to budget issues. This is an example of how most businesses are working with the city in keeping downtown, the heart of Las Banas, welcoming and inviting. However, I feel that we are not getting the same support in return. One of our concerns is the implementation of a special event fee. This year, the Las Banas Downtown Association hosted its annual event in August, Grapes, Hops, and Shops, a wine and beer walk. The money raised goes towards downtown beautification and expenses for maintenance, such as keeping the tree lights operating properly. We were also asked by the city to help defray the cost of hanging the seasonal banners. This year, we gave the city $1,550. We also host the Christmas evening downtown every year. This has been a free of charge event to our community. 
The association would like to expand and add to existing events, but it is discouraging when more rules, regulations, and fees are put upon us. We have so many times heard from the people of the community that they are wanting more things to do in Las Banas. If other communities can do it, why can't we? Having successful events in Las Banas enhances the quality of life for our community. Bottom line, having successful events in Las Banas benefits the city. I would like to see our city be more cooperating and working with the Downtown Association. I've listed just a few ideas as a start. City fees should be waived or be very minimal when we try to hold these events. As stated earlier, we have helped the city monetarily and with physical help from our merchants. We should not have to take on any more expenses. Closing our main street downtown should be made easier when an event is held. We should not have so many restrictions. Our association has full coverage, but the words liability and expense always seem to be a roadblock. I would love to hear the words from the city, what can we do to help you make this event more successful? The signage regulations need to be reviewed for downtown. We received that letter from the city. The small, um, and I emphasize small sign, sign boards, banners, and flags in front of stores gives Main Street personality. Every city has a downtown, and every city knows that their downtown is the backbone to its community. It is exciting to see many new businesses opening up the last few months in our downtown. As merchants, we will continue to take pride in our business and our community and do our best to stay positive. We are just asking the city for a better working relationship. You will help us, and we help you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, I'm Rhonda Lowe, a resident of Los Banos, and to the mayor and city council. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read these spell letters. I'm here tonight as a downtown merchant and a member of the Los Banos Downtown Association. I would like to comment on the proposed fees associated with special events. There is no one that better understands that there are associated costs with doing business better than a business person. So it is not my suggestion that there should be no fees associated with an event. Rather, I would suggest that we look at what the hard costs really are and the importance of the city partnering with local businesses to help business succeed, which in turn brings in revenue to the city through increased sales tax and improving the quality of life in our community when people do shop local. There are numerous examples of how great partnerships are working in communities all around us whose events bring in hundreds, even thousands of people to their downtown creating a vibrant and exciting place together. Merced has many events, but their farmer's market and art hop are shining examples. Turlock has a farmer's market, car shows, and outdoor concerts. Hanford, a town not much, longer than, not much larger than Los Banos, offers spectacular events. Most notably, their Thursday night market draws thousands of people to their certified market, live beer, not live beer, <laughs> live, live music, beer and wine garden, and family fun. I said all of this to say this. There is a core group of very enthusiastic business people that have made not only a financial, but an emotional commitment to our community. Many see our community not for what it is, but for what it could be. We look at communities around us doing the very things we want to do, and they are able to make it happen, rather than being told of all the objections or having the idea killed with excessive fees. I know that we have some council members who wish to see our community thrive and become the vibrant beacon that draws people to us, rather than sending them elsewhere. We can do this by working together, but it requires more than just lip service. If Los Banos wants to portray itself as being business friendly, nothing would say that more than partnering with its own businesses to see real growth in more than just building homes in our town. So I'm here as a merchant, a member of our downtown association, but also a member of this community who would enjoy seeing events grow such as the downtown wine stroll, Christmas evening downtown, the parades and street fairs, events that bring, and you've heard this before, a sense of community to a town that would be made better by bringing us together. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Okay, 
Good evening. For those panels, I'm going to try to make this short because uh, what I've got to say here. Um, this here is in reflection to the last council meeting that I've watched the video for because I was able to make it. And I'd like to just share some of my thoughts about some of the things that were said. So no pun intended. Here it goes. There was, concern, there was a concern with many spots being worn down by the current vendor at Pacheco Park. Many areas are very stressed. It's a park. The current vendor at the park uses due diligence by shifting the setup into different areas to avoid said stress areas. Regarding chuck holes and gopher holes, etc., is the city's responsibility to ensure such dangers as appropriately corrected as they should always be. Many other events have been held at the park. Chuck holes and gopher holes are present at these events. It should be a routine maintenance. Creating a one-day market based on what other cities do. We are Los Banos, not other cities. A one-day-a-week market is in our community isn't comfortable to our unique living style here. A majority of the population work outside the city bringing income into Los Banos. Most of the community not, uh, that earn a living in our city work in retail, having many varied days off, not every Saturday and or Sunday. Many of these people like to purchase the fresh picked products of a local farmer over the grocery chain products that lack the natural flavors and sweetness. These same people only have the Monday holiday off to be able to have the availability to make purchases. Thus, by restricting it to a one day, not only disallows the people of our community to make the desired purchases, but you're inviting the same money brought into Los Banos to be taken right back out, placing the same people and going to other locations in the surrounding areas. Based on the concern of farmers markets in general being open only during the certain time of the year, May through Sat September, I suggest that that issue uh, should be recognized the fact that you're talking about large circus-like providers that practice only during these time frames due to a drop in sales during the off months of the large population areas mentioned compared to a small city or, uh, with a small vendor that has been allowed two days for almost two years. You continually speak of doing what it takes to help the people of Los Banos to have a stable income. Yet at the same time, I can't help but to believe you are attempting to shut down one man, uh, shut one man down. I feel that any current vendor that has been vending for at least 12 months should be grandfathered into the same use up to the two days and up to three days on a Monday type holiday that has previously been allowed to do. That has caused no problems to any person or entity thereof. I've never seen any vendor operate three, four, five days a week plus a holiday, as mentioned by a council member. So I don't see a problem with the current vendor's needs of two days a week being Saturdays and Sundays plus a Monday holiday. A statement that, that produce can only be grown during a certain period of the year and not year-round is false and entirely misleading. Fact is, produce uh, is indeed grown and provided in Central Valley all year round. Apples, grapefruit, beans, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, beets, broccoli, and carrots are just a few items that are available for harvest during the early winter and winter months. Here is a page, here is a one page of several pages of produce that mark 26 items harvested during the early winter and winter months. And I am certain that many of them are listed in the infinite list of items recognized by the farmer's market items. In closing, I am in high hopes that this entire issue is not an agenda to stop one particular person or business from being in business or otherwise destroy his ability to continue making a small living and taking away an asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Not seeing or hearing anyone, I will now close the public forum and we will go on to item 7, consideration of approval of consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be voted on in one motion unless removed from the consent agenda by a city council member. Tonight we have Director Malney. Items on the consent agenda are as follows. Warrant numbers 155300 through 155556 in the amount of $1,002,208.91. Waiver of administrative permit fee for Evangelical Free Church. Minutes for the June 17, 2015 City Council meeting. Minutes for the July 1st, 2015 City Council meeting. 
City Council Resolution Number 5695, amending the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget by increasing the appropriation amount in the general fund for revenue and expenditures in the amount of $5,704.32 for a spay and neuter program grant awarded by the California Department of Food and Agriculture. City Council Resolution Number 5696, authorizing the city manager to purchase wind study equipment from Belfort Instru Instrument to be used in relocation study of the Los Banos Municipal Airport and amending the 2015-2016 budget by in increasing the community and economic development expenditures in the amount of $6,900. And the items are to be approved as submitted. Is there any city council member who would like to remove an item for discussion? Mrs. Lewis? Yes, I'd like to remove item F. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to remove an item? Um, so there are, you want to remove an item? Okay. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item F. Okay. Mrs. Stonegrove? Motion by Silvera, second by Stonegrove, to approve the consent agenda as stated, items A through E, and removing item F uh, for uh, separate consideration. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None. Carried. Mrs. Lewis. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, is it on? There yes. we go. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> in reading this proposal, um, it says that we have an agreement with Waldell uh, Engineering uh, to uh, work on this airport study. And uh, with that decision, Waldell had recommended that the city uh, use a particular vendor to purchase instru the instruments to do the reading. My question is, does, does that have to go out to bid or is this under a different special circumstance? Who wants to answer that? I'm just going to click everybody's mic here. Who else wants? <laughs> it's, it's through the existing contract with Bob Waddell. It does not. It does not require it to go out to bid. Okay. So could you explain to me how, because of the contract and his recommendation? Well, he actually he actually looked at the recommendation for us and talked to three different vendors himself, and this was the only one that responded with any number. So he did what we would normally do in our purchasing policy for this amount of money. He did it, and we only had one bid come back. Okay, so would, would this council have to look at all those three bids? That no, you, 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 you do not. We just have to go out and talk to three people, and if they respond, we pick the lowest at this financial amount. Okay, I, I guess I'm concerned as to how that's different from any other item that we have to uh, be, be, review a bid on. I believe that when it's less than thirty thousand, you get and you ask for three bids, and it comes back under thirty. The city, the city manager can sign. Okay, that answers the question. And what we did here, well, why we brought this back, the bid was actually secondary to the actually changing the budget. That we had to change the budget. That was the biggest thing. The bid was a secondary item, which uh, the city manager could have signed because there was. We did try to get three bids on it. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions on that item? Uh, Mrs. Lewis, did you want to make a motion? Okay. Okay, I, I would like to make a motion to um, accept item number 7F of the consent agenda as submitted. Okay, Mr. Freya. I'll second that. Motion by Mrs. Lewis, second by Mr. Freya to approve item F on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Okay, let's go on to item, uh, I'll get to you in a minute, Mr. Freer. Okay, item number, item A, let's see, what number was that? That was 8A. Public hearing, to receive public comment and consideration of adopting a proposed ordinance for the regulation of special events located in Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Los Vanos Municipal Code. And we'll go to Senior Planner Elms, Me and first. it's... Oh, oh, yes. Just one minute. I want to read the other uh, part of this. Okay, item 1A, ordinance number 1134, adding article 41, chapter 3, to title 9 
of the Los Angeles Municipal Code relating to the special events on public property. Now we'll go to Mr. Ferreira. I have, have to recuse myself on this because uh, it's been determined by the city attorney um, and our analysis that I have a conflict of interest because my wife is the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Commerce runs special events on a regular basis and it could have a, a, an effect on our income one way or another. So, you'll excuse me. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have, uh, looks like item A, we have two actions. So uh, we will take ordinance number 1134 first and we'll go to Senior Planner Elms. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, at the last City Council meeting on September 2nd, we introduced the ordinance, um, but I will go through the presentation um, just to give some background on the proposed ordinance and what we're asking City Council to do tonight. So a background on um, our existing policy, or well, it's really our existing procedures. Currently, right now, um, individuals or groups fill out a form to notify the city of their special event. Um, it goes through the police department um, or the community and economic development department, depending on the type of event. The city then routes through the various departments that are affected by this event. Um, it would go to public safety, depending if there's street closures, or um, if it's involving infrastructure, it would go to public works, um, or any uh, street closures or any barricades that need to happen. And currently, right now, there's no formal process in place. Um, we do have a current ordinance that does discuss special, or, uh, excuse me, special events, but the intent is to address temporary uses of private property that are not a use by right and require additional regulation. This particular ordinance is actually geared towards temporary uses on private property, such as like pumpkin patches, Christmas tree lots, parking lot sales, promotional outdoor events. So it doesn't really address parades, um, those things that need street closures, um, processions, uh, those types of events. So our proposed ordinance that we have before you any person desiring to sponsor a parade, public assembly, or other special event on public property shall first obtain a permit. It goes through and defines what a parade is and what a special event is. There are exceptions within the proposed ordinance. Uh, exceptions are funeral processions, parades on sidewalk, spontaneous events, government entity events, expressive activity, block parties, and farmer's markets. And really the block parties, it's because it's had, it has its own ordinance that is coming before you, um, as well as certified farmer's markets. Also the proposed ordinance um, does go through, if you do need a special event permit, what you must obtain. So um, first, not less, uh, then 30 days or more than one year and two months before the event, you must apply for your special event permit. Within three working days, the Community and Economic Development Department shall circulate to the affected departments for comments. So that would be public works, fire, and police. And then within 30 days, the Community and Economic Development Department shall render a decision to approve, conditionally approve, or deny the permit. And then any appeal on that decision can be made to the Planning Commission. Uh, through the ordinance, it also requires that um, an indemnity agreement be signed uh, to reimburse the city for any costs incurred to any damages on city property. And then um, the event must obtain a liability insurance of at least a million dollars per occurrence and then they shall pay the city for all city department service charges which are incurred in connection with the result from the permit. So what we have before you, and this is based on our discussion um, from the last city council meeting, broken down what the application processing fee would entail. And what we're proposing is, and it's uh, written in detail for you in your staff report as well as in the resolution, uh, there would be a processing fee of the application fee. So that would be about $150. And this would be for the review of the application to analyze um, the application in accordance with the proposed ordinance, to route the application to the various departments, and analyze and provide comments to the Community and Economic Development Department, this would be the time that um, 
Public Works, uh, Public Safety, which is fire and police, would take in analyzing and then providing comments to the uh, Community and Economic Development Department and then time to issue and deny uh, or deny a permit. Um, this would be a full cost recovery. This is, um, as I said, broken down in your staff report. So it's about an hour of the Community and Economic Development Department's time and then about 15 minutes um, for police, fire, and public works. Uh, then we go on to event service charges. Uh, and just to clarify, the proposed resolution is only um, setting forth the fees for the application processing. Uh, so that's the $150. It is not setting forth the event service charges as it varies and it really depends on the size and intensity of an event. So if I were to break this down, and this was based on our conversation um, that we did have on September 2nd, uh, one overtime police officer would equate to $50. And because of a memorandum of understanding that the City of Los Angeles does have with our Police Officers Association, it would be a four-hour overtime minimum. Um, and that is because of the MOU with uh, the Police Officers Association. So if your event um, is only two hours, the city um, is having to pay those employees for four hours. Uh, parades are genuinely, they require one officer at each intersection and um, really parades are the most intense but if we were to break them down, um, processions are different and the city uh, police chief and I sat down uh, after the discussion with city council and really try to break down our events and break down our fees. So uh, parade the difference is that a parade has the streets blocked. Um, they're 24 hours in advance. There's no parking signs that the police department needs to put up. Uh, the public works department gets involved and barricades off the streets as well as all the alleys. Um, and even sometimes where the staging area is, they go out further or um, in other areas they need to barricade for the, uh, another block out. So that's the most intense of an event is a parade. Now a procession is always moving and typically in, in speaking to our police chief, it's really only the use of the police officers. There's not really any barricading of streets. Uh, the police chief, they are able to block off intersections and the procession passes and then the the police department keeps moving. So uh, procession would be significantly less um, than what you see um, as a parade would be charged for. Um, as well as say a, a downtown event that's really only blocking, um, um, for instance, maybe the Strine wine stroll that's only blocking off uh, maybe two blocks of downtown. Um, it would really only, cons it would not consist of any police officer time, but it would consist of the barricades. So it would be significantly less though than a parade. So the public works, they would, uh, for their barricades, and this is really looking at more of a parade and um, about a 10 block possibly a parade, our typical parades, it's closing streets and alleys, and it would be two um, employees at about an hour and a half. Um, so then our, also our parks facility, so depending on the event, it is $35 an hour to use the park. Um, I did uh, speak to Paul Cardoza, our park supervisor, and he was able to confirm for me that the Tiger Sharks are currently paying uh, for Mother's Day in the park. They pay for both of those days. Um, folks that use the, the parks for events rent the park, and um, it's either the Pacheco Park, for instance, it is $280 all day or it's $560 for the both days. So, um, but if you wanted it to rent uh, for hourly, you can do that for $35 an hour. So we are currently um, charging at special events for, for the use of our parks facilities. So um, with that, staff is recommending that the City Council adopt ordinance number 1134, adding article 41 of Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Las Vegas Municipal Code relating to special events, and then adopt resolution number 5697, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of special events. And that concludes my presentation, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Okay. Um. I think at this time what I'd like to do is open 
the public hearing unless council has any pre pressing questions at this time. Okay. I would like to open the public hearing to receive po comment on, and I'm going to read item number two. Uh, we can uh, listen to the public hearing on both of them. City Council Resolution number 5697, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of special events. So if you'd like to comment on A1 or 2, uh, now is your time. Joe Machado from Las Banas, and I would like to, uh, uh, Mayor and Council Members, thank you for your time, but I would like to uh, state that the, uh, my perspective on uh, certain activities that we do in regards to uh, special event of the uh, Our Lady of Fatima issue is a uh, expressive relig religious cultural activity and does not constitute a, um, a uh, procession or parade. And I hope that you um, take that into consideration in your review as a, that a definition of expressive religious cultural activity. And under that circumstance, we should not be subject to any issues of parade or procession. That's the interpretation of our activity. Uh, the way I understand it, maybe not all our members do, but if we approach it in that sense, that, it that would uh, eliminate us from that. It just happens that we do it every year. We express our cultural, religious activity every single year. So please accept that as our definition of our event, mm -hmm. or might anyway. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Suggestion on, excuse me, I like <coughs> Bob Reister, Los Banos. I, uh, I'd like to make a suggestion. Um, we, we now know and understand that there are fees regulated by the city that, that you need to try to recover in some way. We know you're not trying to profit. But it's my suggestion that maybe if I'm an applicant, for example, I come up and I want to apply and I want to pay fees and stuff, that I get a estimated breakdown of what the fees are. So I'm looking and I can understand what I'm paying for. There's no way you can really possibly give an accurate but you can give an estimate i think what by doing so that would help the city itself in eliminating from any propaganda and all this other crap that can be going on we're notorious for so again it's just a matter of if i come up there and i apply for something then by default i should get some sort of a form that lets me understand exactly what i'm paying for and why kind of like what was just showing up there thank you that's part two bob that's what will take place in part two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Thank you for your time and I appreciate uh, all this uh, speeching. Uh, my name is Fernando Barbar, Los Banos uh, resident, and I am uh, here in order to represent the Hispanic community with the Wild Banos Society. As uh, we have been in our cultural uh, procession for the last since I've been joined in this community for 50 years. So, uh, as this uh, person mentioned, it, uh, most of what we do is once a year, two hours, we use the police department for actually an hour, mm -hmm. and our parade is our procession basically is for about 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, it's nobody, I will say probably a mile long, uh, with few people following it. And this cultural and uh, also, a, uh, I will say, is kind of a gathering our community together, principle, is one of the most principal uh, issues for this uh, uh, Hispanic community. So in, in order to uh, continue doing this, we need to have you people to think about what we're doing. And as far as I know, you know exactly what it is, but we are kind of agreed to follow the instructions and the procedures that the city will issue, but uh, we also have some consideration for what, what we basically do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, could you come back for a minute, please? Sure. 
I have a council member who would like to ask you a question. Sure, any, anything. I okay. hope I can answer it. Mrs. Lewis? Yes, uh, Mr. Is it Barba? Yes. Yes, Mr. Barba. Um, you said that you normally have two police officers that accompany your, your procession. What, have you, what has your organization paid in the past for services to the police? We haven't paid any at all. Okay. As far as I know, I, I, they just called me to appear for this uh, matter. Uh, but I will find out and I can let you know. But as far as I know, we have the uh, uh, sponsor by the Diocese of Fresno to do what we do. So as far as you answer, I have no, I mean, your question, I have no answer okay, thank at you. this moment, but I will. Yeah, oh, I'm oh. sorry, but I'll have you come to the podium, okay? Thank you, Mr. Oops. Barber. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, would you come forward, please? If you'd like to speak, I want you to speak, but you gotta... <laughs> and your name, sir, in your city? Yeah, my name is Alberto, and uh, I'm a member of the Paso Society, and, like, uh, he's the big boss, and uh, I have the answer because in a couple, a couple of years ago, I am charged with the Paso Society, and I was dealing with all the paperwork, and thank you for the time. And the past two years, I have no problem. And all the submitted paper, you get on time. And we haven't charged any money. And appreciate the hard work you guys do. And that's why we are as a community. We thanks. And uh, I hope we'll go together and get no fee for that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else you'd like to speak at the public forum or the public hearing on ordinance number 1134, City Council Resolution number 5697? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Edward Amaro, resident of Los Banas, uh, and I'm a director in Los Banas Portuguese DES Association and also a committee member with the Our Lady of Fatima Society. And first off, I just want to thank the council for their concerns about the cost at the last meeting which resulted in the staff report so you know that's one of the things that i've heard from several of the people it's a cost you know and and i understand that i also wanted to thank staff for their information in this last staff report which kind of details the cost and really when it, if you look at the staff report there's pretty detailed information about the permit fees that were listed $150 and why they're that there's also pretty detailed information about the public works fees and what they were if you have to have barricades and things the part that's a little less clear in the report and, and I got some clarification from the chief was able to talk to him was the police charges so the police charges don't really and I understand each events different but they're not really spelled out at quite as clearly I'm sure it depends on the event this event of course has been going on for both of them for many years so you would hopefully would have a pretty good idea of what the cost is going to be I think the concern I have and I think the groups too is that as the staff uh, person Ms. Elms pointed out today you're passing the the ordinance and a resolution that sets forth the permit fees but she made it clear the council is not setting any of the service fees so there's no oversight on these service fees the service fees are going to get charged to these organizations based on what the actual cost would be and that makes sense and, and, and like with the public works, they kind of lay it out. What's it going to be? This police charge is a little less clear. And the concern I have is I've talked to other people, same organizations, different cities where they had similar ordinances. And it started off at a certain amount. And then later on, they had different charges. And they would fluctuate from year to year. They'd have less people at the event. And the charges were more. I mean, they weren't even similar. And one of the persons here can speak to it. And so, and I asked him, well, why, you know, why were these charges different? And he said, well, it really kind of depended on who the police chief was or the city manager, not, you know, because the council wasn't involved with setting these fees. So, you know, and I taught, know the police chief, have a good relationship with him. I think he wants to try to work with us. But I'm telling you, down the road, that's 
a concern because they really, these fees were not consistent in these other jurisdictions. So that's one of the big concerns is what are the fees going to be? Are they going to be the same every year? I mean, they have less people, you've got more fees. The other thing, we do want to cooperate if there's ways we can reduce the fees. Since there's volunteers, that would be great. Uh, I won't speak too much to the constitutional issues that Mr. Michelle raised other than I will note that before it was at the last meeting it was said, well, we need to charge all groups these fees. We have city dollars involved. But when I look at the ordinance, you, ex you expressly exclude activities or events conducted by a governmental entity. So I'm like thinking, well, I'm not sure quite why that's the case. I mean, they're somehow excluded from paying the fees in the ordinance. And then most of the other exceptions really have to do with First Amendment rights, but I think as Mr. Machado pointed out, that's arguably there's First Amendment rights when you're dealing with religious expression. So in closing, you know, I just want to see a fairness and reasonable fees. I think that's what I'm hearing from the people at the chamber and, and that there is some kind of oversight going forward because, you know, I understand in other jurisdictions that that's not, you would think the fees would be the same, but they weren't. In the same event, same people, actually less people sometimes. So my concern is, is that it's fair and reasonable for all the groups and, and that they're able to continue with their activities. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public forum? Hi, my name is Kathy, a resident of Los Banos. They pretty much said a lot of what I was already going to say. The um, few things I want to bring up, um, in fact, Stacy had mentioned at the last time it was brought to the meeting, the 150 fee is based on an hour of her time, the police department, the fire department, and public works. But they said that some of these events have been going on for so long, it's sort of like a stamp and go. Because they have the same route, they have the same amount of volunteers that have to work it, same amount of police, and they know what intersections, where the cones are supposed to go, everything else, such as your DES and your other parades that have been going on for years. I was wondering if there was an option, if it's something that is just a red stamp and it's automatic, if there could be less of a fee for them to do those and not flat $150, because I'm sure it doesn't take Stacy an hour to do the DES parade. I, I was just concerned about that, so that if something is repetitive, they do it every year, it's an annual event, if it could be less. Um, well, why don't we get you an answer? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Let me, let me ask. Yeah, the answer, this is the minimum. The absolute minimum, 150 bucks. Okay, that's so it, it is. Costs. That's it. That's the minimum. That so is your that, rock bottom. Okay. And, and that we're not in the business to make money. Okay. And we keep saying this over and over. I just had to ask. It comes back that it sounds like we don't want to be fair or we don't want to, you know, do what's right. We want to see events in town. We just, we're, we're, we're worried about the health, safety, and welfare of 37,000 people. So we want you to do well. We want you to succeed, because when you succeed, we do. But we have to be insured. We have to have safety, health, safety, welfare. So yes, what you're hearing is okay. Stacy, the staff, the city attorney, myself, we have spent an inordinate amount of time on this. And it just seems like we keep rehashing it over and over. And I got to tell you, it's getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, I don't want to be on your nerves. No, I'm just, I'm just, if you can't tell, it is. I just have because to be Because we keep, you know, we keep having the same conversation over and over. So, 150 bucks, that's the minimum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, the other thing I wanted to, I was looking at how much it would cost and looking at the fees. I need to know, um, for your police officer, uh, maybe Chief Brissy could answer a question. If it's a minimum of four hours and that you're going to be paying him, can we, for anyone at any event, utilize him for that whole four hours? <laughs> Garrett, would you hit the microphone right there? Yeah, if I understand your, your question correctly, Kathy, yeah. yes, I think we could as long okay. as I... 
as long as it's something that I approve of, yes. Okay, because I'm just looking at a minimum, um, you know, a minimum amount of hours, and most of your parades they might be used to cross Pacheco one time, and that's it. And I don't know how much time that would involve. In well, you have to keep in mind that um, there are MOU-related issues where there's exactly. required minimum, so um, it just gets tricky and it's difficult and. I'd love to address the idea of what Ed talked about and some of the other parades. Um, I hate to do it from this microphone, though, so um, I'd love to talk about that further if you guys are interested in it. Okay. Um, and the other one is I don't know, are vital, vital people part of the police department since it's set up by the police department? If you request to have the vital team do something, because I know... Um, at the one parade that went to the DES hall, I think there were six or eight vitals. Is that part of that charge or no, because they're volunteers? Okay. The vital volunteers are, are individuals who have been uh, basically volunteering for city events yes. for a number of years. And, and part of what I, what I spoke about at the last meeting is we're not recharging our vital volunteers. And, and these individuals have worked, some of them, 20, 30 years. And, and they, they could possibly volunteer for an event, uh, but it, the problem is that, I get, well, I'll just say it. If we could get more vital volunteers, and you have to be accepted by the police department, mm -hmm. and you have to be trained by the police department, it could greatly reduce the cost of your event because they would be trained. But the fear of, uh, of having a vital volunteer is that they, after they're trained by the police department, they're only going to volunteer for that one event. And that would be wrong after all the training that we put into to all these volunteers. So, I, you know, this is a tough one. I, I marched in these processions. I did it since I was 10 years old. I've been in all these parades. We we all want to make make a fair deal, and and how we can keep all these going. And when I was talking to Gary and I was talking to the city manager, how can we reduce these costs? And and the, the chief has offered to sit down with you and and discuss these things. No, 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 I know, but I still need to, I still <laughs> I need to answer, <laughs> I still need to answer all this. Yeah, I know, and, and that's I why I'm asking. And I can this time because the city attorney, it, it's an agendized item. So, okay. so we can, we can kind of talk and the other council members want to chime in, I'd love to have them do it. But we have to find a way to meet our needs and for you to be profitable and volunteerism is the way to go. Because we're talking $200 for officer because yes. we have an MOU. That MOU says that we have to pay four mm -hmm. hours at $50 per hour. That's $200 per officer. If we could get vital people helping, trained vital people, and not just the ones that we have now, because they volunteer for a number of events and we're burning them out. Mm -hmm. If we could have new people trained, we could get these costs down considerably, and then if if uh, if if they are able to uh, uh, to do things within the city because we cover them under our workers' comp, uh, it's it's possible to to work that way. Um, I don't know about lifting requirements with barriers. I'd have to discuss that with Mark Fachin uh, to 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 know whether uh, they could they could actually participate in that area, mm -hmm. but. There's a way to get this down and to be minimal cost. And that way the police chief can feel well about what we're doing. Which I think is, would solve some of your dilemma if you had a list and said, this is what our charges are. This is how you can lower that charge. Mm -hmm. If you gave that to the people who are putting on these special events, it would be real helpful to them. There's less unknown that it's that unknown that is causing your public to come up here and ask question well, after I, question I after have, question. I have, I have a suggestion. And... The police chief actually opened the door and said, you know, he'd be willing to meet with people. Maybe we could do that. Maybe we could have a meeting and, and talk a little bit about, about so there's more of an understanding 
and you you would feel a little bit better about about what's happening or make some suggestions to the police chief but but I can tell you the key is volunteerism and the but only way to but get some these people don't agree with volunteerism they'd rather have a paid police officer okay the, yeah, and, yeah. and yes and thank you for saying that yeah they'd rather have a, a paid a police officer yes, yes. which and, is expensive so okay, that's why yes and there's no way there is no way for us to cut that cost no way now now how many police officers do we need how many how much is a is a parade going to cost how much is the estimate for that uh you know if if uh, I went through and just went by what was listed on um, the packet that you all uh -huh. received. Um, and I did it just the minimum for the DES parade was $725. An Easter parade was $725. OLF's about $325. I did have the Halloween parade for the kids and your homecoming parade, I had an estimate. But then I found out that the school district is part of the government, so they don't get charged. <laughs> and so that's why I didn't bring that. Okay. Yes. I think I can get Go ahead. This one. Go we ahead. talked about this at the last meeting, and I'll say it again. Mm -hmm. Come in, talk to Gary, our police chief, and say, "Here's our event. It's this long. It's yellow. It's going to be this many hours a day." And he will work up a number for you, and then that's where the conversation starts. Okay. And what he'll try to do is find creative ways to lower that figure. We are not in the business to make money or jam anybody up. We don't want to be known as those guys. That's what government sounds like. What we want to do is just make sure our costs are covered and everyone is safe. That's simple. We're making way too much out of this tonight. So when you say, I don't know what the costs are, tell me more about your event and we'll tell you what the costs are. And I appreciate you doing the math. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Do that. No, come in. That's a good starting that point. May not, may not, that may, may not be the cost. So. Again, I think we're, yeah. we're, we're mm -hmm. getting a little I'm off sorry track to here. No, I think you. Oh, so no, no, no. I feel like so, he's going to get a no, nerf gun out in a second. That, 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 no, it's because when you <laughs> keep asking the same question and I keep giving you the same easy. answer, and you're, you're expecting a different yeah. answer. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. You know, okay. I was just concerned. Okay. And we're, I'm sorry I didn't okay. hear okay. all those remarks in regards to the pricing and how much it would right. be. This right. is the first time I saw the breakdown in regards to how much it would cost. So if you brought it up before, all I heard was 150 and the rest of it would be nominal. That's what I heard. Okay. I did not hear a breakdown. Okay, Kathy, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cut you off right now. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I, I it, yes, yes, I, uh, you already spoke. So I have to, I have to have someone else. For, uh, no, you can't come back up again just one time. If you have someone in your organization who else would like to speak, I would love to have them come up. And I would ask that you consider the. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, first, I want to go through. Is anyone else? Would anyone else like to speak at the public forum? or public hearing, I'm sorry. Anyone else would like to speak at a public hearing on item uh, 8A, was that 8 or, yes, 8A12. Is there anyone who else would like to speak who hasn't, who has not approached the, uh, the mic already? Okay, I would like to close the public hearing and bring it back to council level and, uh, and uh, comments council members. Okay, Mrs. Lewis, you first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, this this is a real hot issue here in, in our city right now, and um, there are some things that the city needed to take care of in regards to its financial budgeting of these type of events. Um, but and la and at the, our last meeting. Um, when we had the public hearing, the one thing that I brought up is that no one here knew what the fees were going to be. And with open government, you need to provide that information to the public. They have the right to know what they're going to pay for any particular service that a city provides to them. And they have the right to see it, not just to hear it. Um, I call a few cities and some chambers of commerce and um, wasn't able to get much help uh, 
one chamber of commerce that responded back to me was Hollister. And they put on approximately, between the chamber and their downtown association, 25 events a year. Um, and this doesn't include the farmer's market at all, which is a total separate event that, that they also put on. And right now, their current fees are for um, a street closure is $100, and for a permit for a parade is $150. Now, I was told by the chamber that uh, their city council may be looking at some additional fees because um, the cost of staff time um, is not being covered for these two, these uh, events that happen. Um, on each of those events, so the city has to make a resolution for each of the events that happen, and then each of the events is charged the hundred dollars plus the hundred and fifty dollars if it if it's a parade. So it's a hundred dollars for the street closure, a hundred and fifty for the parade. Um, and and when I looked at the fees that we were charging, and you know, it, it is significantly more. Uh, one of the things that came to my mind is for organizations that are having multiple events in a year, you know, we could possibly maybe work something out with the city where all that paperwork is submitted for your street fairs, for your parades, um, and have it done all at one time so there's not this fee that's being done over and over again for each event that you're having thereby reducing the cost. And if the event is the same, then, you know, the time to review them shouldn't be any more, I would think, than the hour of staff time to do it. Um, in regards to the police department, that, that's a whole other animal because, you know, from what I'm hearing just from one person coming here for their event, they've not been charged a fee by the police department and I assume that we haven't charged anything for public works to put out barriers um, in our community for these events. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I guess maybe I'm looking at perhaps if we can look at the possibility of charging the application fees and try that out for the first couple of years and see how that works out and then if it's not working out that the additional fees for uh, public works and police, um, that they're adding up to the point where our city can't encumber those costs, then we look at instituting that. It, it's just a lot of money all of a sudden for our uh, businesses and our community organizations to bear. And I'm not saying that anyone uh, group is richer than the other, that's not the point. I'm just looking at the mere fact that it's, it's quite a bit of money. And in my calculations, unlike some of the other people, um, including the insurance uh, that you have to get to cover the city, uh, you're looking at maybe $1,200 or more. Um, so with that in mind, I'm, you know, I think the council has the right to say that we're not going to charge X amount of fees for a particular category or yes we'll institute these fees for a particular category and I'm only one voice up here but we do talk about being a business friendly community and um, I don't want the city to incur the cost of doing business but I think we need to look at what we're asking of our community of our business community <clears throat> as far as what they bring in uh, for entertainment and uh, lifestyle for our community and for the um, religious and other community organizations that uh, have done things for 100 years or some even less. Um, I, I, I struggled with this, but I, I think it's, you know, for me, it's the right thing to do at this particular time. I think $1,200 for each event is a lot of money uh, for some organizations that may be struggling. 
and um, I, I, I would like to see that we would do something that would be a little more economically feasible to the businesses that we're working with and to the organizations. One of the things that the, the Hollister Chamber shared with me is that they're going to look at cutting back events if their city institutes a lot of uh, these fees <laughs> and with the cutting back of events with the number of uh, community events they put on a year, which bring in a lot of money, that's less tax dollars to the city. And, um, you know, those, those things are important as, as far as a city's operation and budgeting as well. So I, you know, I believe in everybody paying their fair share. And, um, but I, I kind of think that, you know, $1,200 is a lot of money for each individual uh, event that has to be put on as far as a parade is concerned and I would just like the council to consider maybe that we institute the application process and that we look at um, perhaps if there's more than one event in a year that an organization is doing that all that application for the entire year is brought in and looked at um, to uh, make it a culmination rather than charging individually. And if, for, you know, by chance that the council decides that we need to move forward uh, with the fees in the other areas, I certainly would like to encourage anybody out there uh, to please come to our police department and put in your application for the vitals unit. Um, and, and you'll be contributing to this as well, rather than just to your organization. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. As the, um, as uh uh, the people have mentioned up here that it is a starting point. It's not a concrete figure. And, you know, and I'm looking at the DES guys, and you can call your celebration anything that you want, and we can find a term for anything. And we just had another group come up, and they have a religious celebration. And, and I don't know how many churches we have in this town, but they could call theirs a religious celebration of, of, uh, of, of any kind. And what I don't want to get into is, is some kind of property right, because one function has gone on, and that means a new one can't be added. Because I'd be just as wrong, and I wouldn't be representing everyone who's out there and in the community, and I don't think anyone else would up here. A mention was uh, made by, uh, by Mr. Amarell about the school district not paying. We have an, an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, that it's a joint use agreement. Uh, they help us out, we help them out. And so that, that's what that kind of falls under. Uh, and, and that memorandum of understanding has worked out well, so we could we could help, and we could help the school children too. And uh, and in, and if we need a facility, that's it's kind of it, it's kind of going both ways. And and that's something that's, that's been worked out with the schools, uh, and it's been signed into agreement. The the idea of of uh, consolidating the events. Um, I can tell you that, that our chief has been wonderful that way because we had one group who came with 12 events and all of them had alcohol. And so there was a separate fee for each time this group had an alcoholic, I don't want to say alcoholic event, yeah. oh my God. an event with spirits. And instead of charging for each individual use, or to review, he reviewed all 12 events, 10 or 12 events, and one fee was charged. So save the, the organization a tremendous amount of money. Now, I can see, I think Mrs. Lewis brings up a good point, that if something doesn't change and uh, we don't have to put the staff time into it, uh, there's, I, I think there's a, a great possibility that this council could, uh, could, could work and, and see what staff thinks after about uh, about taking events and consolidating them if they don't change if they have numerous events. Um, 
or events year after year if something didn't change. I, I think maybe there's a possibility, depending upon what the council thinks, that there's a, a way to give and take a little bit. Um, the I see the difference between the processions and the parades and which one costs more and why it costs more. So I think with that, you know, I've made a few comments, but I, I want to hear anyone else. I see Mrs. Stonegrove and Mr. Uh, Silvera both have their lights on. So Mr. Silvera, you're first. I'm going to let you go. I, yeah, a couple questions. It is, I don't know if the city attorney is, is, can or is, has the ability to answer the expressive religious cultural activity. If you could give me more clarification on that. Yes. Actually, there's an exemption in the ordinance for expressive activity as long as it's not blocking traffic and as long as it's obeying all of the traffic laws. So you could have a procession theoretically down a sidewalk as long as you were uh, dealing with all of the traffic laws, um, so on and so forth. It's when that activity creates uh, a closure of a park or a closure of a street that's that's when you get into the permitting process and we've tried to cut some into some exemptions to protect expressive activity in terms of um, things that are uh, spontaneous which is very typical in these types of ordinances but the fact that you have an expressive activity doesn't give you carte blanche to have a parade down the middle of a street without a permit and so um, it is expressive activity. It's recognized as expressive activity. And we're not trying to quelch any expressive activity. It's just that when you're using public property that's costing the public money or you're closing down a street, you're going to need a permit. And if you have a expressive activity that's going to draw 5,000 people, you need to have a permit so that the city can review what's going on. So. There are some exemptions for expressive activities, especially in the area of a spontaneous uh, gathering because of a current event, like we've been seeing lately all around the country. Um, there's also an exemption for expressive activity where you're not closing down a street, doing something like that. So, Okay, very good. Thank you. And then the next thing is, is if I could ask, Chief Breezy had mentioned that he would love to speak to a few of the items, and I would love to hear from him on that, and, and I'll have some questions for him. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and everyone in attendance tonight. Thank you for all your comments. Um, it is a very difficult task that we have trying to balance the needs of the departments that we all run efficiently and the needs of the public. Um, I'm glad Ed came up and contacted some other jurisdictions and determined that, it's, I don't want to say it's fuzzy math, but it's hard to pinpoint an answer for some of these agencies to do these things, police agencies specifically, because it is. It's not easy. Um, there's a lot of variables that come into play, and what I wanted to talk to everyone about was the idea of how this all goes down. So we can come up here and talk about all the different parades that go on and say, can there be a flat fee? Of course there can. There can be a flat fee. We can set a price forward if every parade went down the same path every time. That's one way we can accomplish that. Um, some of the variables that even play into those situations are uh, we have vital volunteers. We discussed this at the last meeting. If we can use volunteers, I would love to decrease the price. I'm going to give you two examples. We had our last meeting a few nights ago, and we said, hey, we have an event coming up. On a Saturday, who's available? We had one, maybe two people raise their hands. And then we said, we have another event coming up, the Veterans Parade, um, on November 7th. Start lining up at 9, it starts at 11. I'll give Cassandra a, a little prop for that. Um, we had seven or eight people raise their hands. So that's one of the variables that we play with. I'd love to use the volunteers all of the time to reduce that cost, but they're volunteers. So that's tough. Um, the other variable is we don't know what the route is. Um, there have been a number of parades in the last couple years alone that have changed the route. And so for us to be able to put a set number on that parade, and I know some are typical, and I know some parades have been the same for years. I understand that. Um, but it's very difficult until I see the application and what the parade route is and to put a price tag on it. I'll give you another variable. 
if there is a parade where I can assist or any of the other FLSA exempt employees can assist, if I can force the commanders or police services manager to come out and work that parade, which we do often, um, we cut the price down. There's four people there by themselves. So when we talk about having the ability to come in and say it should be easy to set a price, you're right, it should be easy. But man, I'm telling you, it's one of the hardest things that we do because I'm trying to balance the idea of these parades and processions that go on uh, because my children are in many of them. I enjoy going to them with the idea that we've got to be responsible in our responsive, we have to be responsible to our task of uh, making sure that we're spending tax dollars efficiently. So there's a lot of different things that go on and it's really easy to say it's easy, but it's not. So like the mayor mentioned, the city manager has mentioned, I would love to sit down with anyone who is interested to say, this is my map, this is what we plan to do, um, whether it's a road closure involved, it's a procession where there's just two cops involved. And I could go on for half an hour about all the different events that we work and how the prices are different because each event is just a little bit different. Uh, Valley Crisis has an, a march coming up next month. And they, to reduce the price for their event, they walk down the side of the street on the sidewalk. They're not required to get a special event permit. They're not required to get insurance. We all meet at the park. We all walk over the overpass. Uh, everyone's got signs. Everyone's got balloons. We try to stick to the right side of the road. We're on the sidewalk. And we're able to accomplish that at a lesser cost. But it's just as, as successful. So I'll close with that. If anyone has any comments, I would love to answer them after the meeting. Uh, talk to you all night long if we need to to get this to get this answered. So, Chief, before you before you leave, you know you mentioned the volunteers. A volunteer is worth two hundred bucks. If they're trained by our police department, they're worth two hundred dollars. How long is the training, Chief? The training's not very long at all, to be uh, quite honest. It's a liability issue from my standpoint mm -hmm. of getting people on our insurance, getting them recognized by the city as a legitimate volunteer. There is some training that goes on. We have monthly meetings. Um, we're going to have a meeting next month, I believe it is, and we're going to talk about road closures. We're going to talk about barricades. We're going to talk about how do we do some of these parade issues that we do. And it's just one of the ongoing, last two months ago, we talked about radio etiquette and how do you talk on the radio when you're a volunteer. Defensive driving, we do all those things. So the training process um, isn't the most difficult. The, my primary concern is to make sure that you are um, the type of volunteer that the community would want, have serving as a volunteer, and that we make sure that we cover you with insurance and for liability reasons. Okay. Did I cover and, everything okay? And, uh, yeah, I, great job. I mean, Mr. Silvera, do you have more questions? Yeah, one more. Okay, go ahead. Hey, come on. All right. So, did the groups come in and sit with you? The price that you'll be giving them is the price based on worst case scenario? What we because obviously, if they came and sat down with you now for an event that's taking place next year, you don't know whether you're going to have yeah. how many volunteers yeah. you would have with that. that that's actually a very, uh, that's a very good point. We could have uh, four volunteers sign up for an event two weeks from now, and then two days from the event occurring, all four of them cancel for personal reasons. So uh, there's just a number of variables. The longer that we push out the, the get-together, I'm going to give you solid numbers based on overtime rates and some of the um, agreements that we have with people. And then we always work backwards. What we're talking about with the $50 an hour is primarily for a road closure. We talk about uh, an officer per block on a parade. That's more of a road closure, made a fair veterans parade, Christmas parade. When we're talking about a procession of the DES hall or some of the other groups where MLK, Cesar Chavez, where there's a group of people walking down the street and there isn't bystanders cheering people on and it's, this is more of a, a gathering of the, the people that are actually walking, we can do that far less because we don't have the road closures. We don't have the, the overwhelming commitment for the public safety. We can do that with two or three people. We do that very often. And if we can do it with a volunteer, I'm sorry to keep rambling, the price goes down. And so then <laughs> that, that fee that's charged, is it, is, so, I get, so if I come in and I'm having, a, I'm having a procession, I come in, 
I'm going to pay the $150 admin fee, permit fee. When is that determined? If I come in a month before and I want to pay my fee, you guys sit down, you come up with, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to need two guys, three guys, whatever it is. Do they pay it then? Or is it on the day of, after no, the event, yeah, they get a bill and they pay how it? How we've done it thus far is we do it after the event, we send an invoice out. That's the easiest way for us to do it because there are all those variables that we've already talked about. Some days, one volunteer will sign up and then six will show up. And we're like, hey, great, we'll utilize you guys instead. So there are a number of moving parts and I wish I could, I could give a concrete answer. I can assure everyone in this room that we try really hard every day to make the events as, as popular and as good for every resident of this community as we can. And I, and I don't think anybody doubts that you guys are trying to do that. I think that you guys do a phenomenal job at what you do. It's just, I guess it's just really difficult to come up with a number because if I sit with you today and you're counting on, you know, you're going to have to pay three offers, three officers, four hours each minimum of overtime, I'm looking at 600 bucks for, you know, a two-hour event, one-hour event, it doesn't matter, or if it's four-hour event, versus, and then the day of, if, you know, we did. We discussed this a month before, and then two weeks before, you put the put the word out, "Hey, we're going to have this event here," and you get three volunteers show up. Well, now that six hundred goes down to zero, and then on the day of, one of those volunteers doesn't show up. So now you got to bring in an officer. So that so it's just yeah. it's just really a, a, a moving number. And I guess in the conversations that I had with a couple of the people that are interested in this item is. is they get the they get the the, in, the fee. They get the you know they need to have the insurance. But for them, it was is coming up with that number. That's the, the, it's that unknown is what scares them because at the end of it, all of a sudden they don't want to get a bill in the mail for three thousand dollars. And I'm not saying that it's going to be that high, but I I, I guess I agree with you. That's the frustration. So I guess the starting point is is to come up with that worst case scenario number and let them see what that number is going to be. You know, and and we've done that actually. That, that's ex actually exactly what we did in the veterans parade. Um, we gave them a price based on what we thought it was going to take to accomplish exactly what we went out and did. Um, at the end of the day, because of some of the maneuvering that we did with our staff and the volunteers, we cut the price almost in half. I think we actually cut it more than in half. It's more than more than half yeah. off, and it was a very minimal cost for that large parade. Yeah. And, and so, I would tell you that in that yeah. parade, we probably cut a little bit too much because we're running up and down blocks trying to keep people out because for whatever reason, people in cars mm -hmm. don't like to listen to barricades. But that's our goal. We're going to give them a, a worst-case scenario based on the application of what the request is, and we're going to work with them every minute of the day to try and get that cost down. What kind, how many hours of training are we looking at plus monthly meetings? What would you say offhand? If, if people wanted to become vital volunteers and they were cleared by you and bear in mind you have to go through a background check by the police department and be cleared by the chief of police it's almost as hard as becoming a caretaker of an animal <laughs> it's, it's tough to be a, 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 a foster parent to an animal but now you've got to go through all this too so what are we talking what are we talking about chief our, our monthly meetings are about an hour, hour and a half long. Uh, mixed in those meetings, there's training. Um, we're actually formalizing the training a little bit better than we mm -hmm. have been in the last three months. Uh, it's a resource issue for us, and it has been, uh, but we're getting that back on the ground. So I would say a year's training, um, and when we can pull off a Citizens Academy, we'll ask that all the volunteers attend that as well. But I would say on an, a yearly I would say about 12 hours. It's, 12 not a, hours. it's not an enormous commitment at all. And 200 bucks a person. My only, my only suggestion for those who wish to become a volunteer, there's a lot of work involved. There are a lot of, um, there's a process that we go through that costs money. I would just hate to see someone become a volunteer, yes. go to one event and say, I mentioned that. I'll see you guys next year. Yeah. Because you're not going to be around as a volunteer because our, yeah. we need a commitment from you for a little bit more than yeah. once a year. Yeah. So. Well, the chamber's easy. They just have a lot of events, and and you know, and, and, and the things that you can, you know, something. I, I, you've been talking about this. I've been pushing it. If you'll accept me, and I can pass a background check, I'll. 
<laughs> I'll, I, I'd like to volunteer. I would take everyone up, up there tomorrow if you'd want. Okay. I consider me the person who would like to volunteer for that. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask Stacy yeah. a question. So, thank you, Chief. Stacy, Stacy, when they come in and they a person comes in and submits their application. Um, and then you submit it around all, all the different groups that need to look at it. At that point, when it comes back, they will, they will, they'll know what, what, the, what the police department's roughly going to charge them. They'll know all that. And then is, at that point, will they pay the $150 fee? Wait, 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 sorry. There you go. According to the ordinance, it's only when the permit is ready to be issued. Okay. So the fee needs to be paid prior to issuance of the permit. And if the applicant decides, you know, that's too much for us after um, routing their application and going through the process, then um, then they wouldn't pay for the service charge, obviously. And that, to me, that, that may, at least, you know, for this first year, if this deal passes through the first year, I, I'm, I'm glad that it's that way because they're going to have an opportunity to get it looked at and see what they're looking at. And, and for, you know, some reason, if they can't go through with it, mm -hmm. Then I would hate to, you know, charge them a hundred and fifty dollar fee for something they're not going to be able to follow up with. Exactly. So Gary's even offering a, a preliminary discussion before the application comes to staff. So before you pay the hundred and fifty dollars, Gary, I'd like to sit down with your organization. Okay, Mrs. Stonegrove. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just like to say I appreciate all of the comments made at the public hearing. Um, earlier this evening at the public forum from all the members of our community who put on these events. Um, they definitely add culture to Los Banos and um, bring a sense of community. They're all great, wonderful events. But I want, also want to reemphasize some of the comments made earlier about um, that we are operating under cost recovery basis solely. And if the applicants of the events don't pay for the event to be held, that cost doesn't just disappear. The taxpayers pay for that. So um, again, we're not in a business to make money. We just want to make sure that the events pay for themselves. Um, I have a question um, for the police chief, I guess. Um, in regards to processions only, can they be led by a vital volunteer if there's one available, or do they have to be led by a, a sworn officer? That's a good question. We have two vital vehicles, and they serve uh, as procession leaders, and they they trail the procession as well. So currently, if we have vo vital volunteers available for an event like a procession, um, we use them all the time, as often as we can. Okay, so is it conceivable for an event, a procession specifically, um, they'll have to pay their $150 um, permit fee. If there are volunteers available and they're not blocking off any streets at that event, and I understand it could not always be like this, but that it could be $150 for their event. Yes. Okay, thank you. I get to drive a car? No. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, any other com uh, comments from council members? Scott? And so I would like to encourage those groups to, you know, I, I look at some of these um, processions that have been going on for many years, and, and I don't see, I attend them, I go to them, um, and I don't see them going away. They're not going to go away because of a fee that the city imposes, but that doesn't give the city the right to just charge some astronomical fee. So um, I'm confident that um, Chief Breezy is going to do the best possible that he can by the groups. And believe me, if, if, it's, if it's unfair, I'm going to hear about it, and I would expect to hear about it. So I, I just, you know, I, I encourage that. Um, I want to see these these events that have been going on as long as I've been alive, I've been attending them. I want them to, I want to see them continue to go on. Um, so what I would encourage the leaders of those groups to make it a point to come in and sit down with Chief Breezy and get what the worst case scenario fee is going to be, and and then we'll we'll move forward from there. Um, you know, I don't think it's as bad as everybody's thinking. I, and I, again, I said it earlier. I know that one of the biggest issues is is that. It's the unknown. That's what the groups are most concerned about, is the unknown. And I think that we could, to the best of our ability today, answer that unknown by 
meeting with Chief Breezy ahead of time. So, um, if there's no further I have one more question. Go I'm for sorry. it. Um, and Mrs. Lewis, you have a question too? Okay. Um, Stacy, is it possible if things are going to stay status quo on maybe a, a, uh, um, a route, a, a procession, a, an event where everything is going to be the same and they're not going, there, there aren't going to be any variables, is it possible to, to work with the fee a little bit? Answer that? Yeah, I think we already answered that. Mm -hmm. Well, the city manager said. Yeah. Uh -huh. The city manager said it's the minimum right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, as the city manager said, it is the minimum right now. Mm -hmm. That the first year, or so it will take longer than an hour. It will take longer than 15 minutes for each mm -hmm. of the departments. That is that best case scenario, and that's at a, at a very minimum. Mm -hmm. um, what community and economic development do, we do analyze um, thoroughly, and it does take quite a bit of time. So even just an hour um, is is minimal cost, you know, minimal time. And 15 minutes, that's me asking a lot of the departments, and those are department heads, to, to be looking at the permit in just 15 minutes. Um, I mean, at a staff level, we could discuss whether if it's a street fair and it's it's in the fall, it's in the spring, it's the state, same street fair, yeah. um, possibly, but okay. uh, when it comes to an organization having multiple different events, I'm going to be, I know I'm going to be spending more time, and I know each of the departments okay. are going to be analyzing okay. each of the events. You've, you've answered my question. Okay. If you talk about, it, just like when the chief approved 12 uh, liquor permits mm -hmm. in one swell swoop, instead of fell swoop, instead of making them pay individual fees. Uh, you've answered my question. If we look at two street fairs and if we can consolidate something into one if something doesn't change, I think you've answered my question. I'm very pleased with that answer. And and if, if someone's going to have multiple events that are similar events, then maybe that, that's the way we can possibly consider something. And and so I'm, I'm good with that. And then we can have a check and balance later on. Uh, to to bring this up to date to see how this is going, maybe a six or seven month report uh, to see how this is going and and see how the uh, uh, the individual groups feel. So uh, DES, you've got your marching orders, so to speak, and uh, and so I, I think uh, and and the other religious group, uh, the other Mr. Barbara, does Mr. Barbara spoke, yeah, and and so so you've got you've got ideas of how to reduce the cost down to, I, I can't take another comment, okay? All right, thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, you have to stand for me, thank you. Okay, okay. And, uh, and so uh, we want to get these costs down. The chief has outlined how to get these costs down. Chamber, uh, we're expecting you, we're expecting the DES, Mr. Borba, any group that's out there, you meet with the chief. Find out how you can reduce these costs, and I'm going to encourage everyone, and I'm going to tell you all the, the organizations, go back and get one or two volunteers that you feel would be good, vital volunteers to be trained, but not one that's going to work one event and only your event. Because we can reduce these costs. You heard the chief. He made the comment. Everyone up here feels the same way that I, I can think of, of how to save you money. So I'm going to leave it in your hands, and we can take care of this maybe to reduce these costs where it's just minimal just to cover our costs. Okay. All right. Mrs. Lewis. Well, I, I want to thank Chief Breezy for uh, coming to the podium and, and clarifying some things. Um, and, and I know that if processions decide to use the public sidewalk to walk on, that it's, not, it's going to cost you basically just the permit process. But then I also know some processions are not going to walk on the sidewalk uh, because that's traditionally not what they do. Uh, so with that in mind, um, you know, Personally, I would be in favor of the application process alone for the for this first year to see how things go. 
um, because we, we do, the city has to recover costs and not give away public funds to do uh, business with organizations that are not a part of the city. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a real tough position to be in, and, you know, I will just reiterate what the mayor has indicated. Please, anyone that you know uh, that would qualify as a vital, and, and again, not to just work your event, but to be a helper within our city to help other organizations reduce the cost of their event. It, it's working to make it all successful, not just your event alone. And um, I'm just hoping that this will work out uh, for all of us in the city. And I agree with the mayor that we need to look at this possibly in six months um, and maybe in a year to see how it's working out with the fees uh, to keep these organizations going, to keep the sense of community and to keep the sense of culture going because that's what America is all about. You know, we have many cultures within our communities and within our different cities and we certainly don't want people to feel like they have to give up their identity because it costs too much money to do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I just got another vital volunteer, Eric Lamont. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious about this. Please find out how to volunteer. 12 hours a year isn't going to kill you. All right. Uh, Mr. Silvera. Mr. Mayor, if there are no further comments, I would like to make a motion to waive the second reading of. Uh, hold on a second. It's two parter here. Ordinance number 1134 as read by title. Mrs. Stonegrove. Second. Motioned by Silvera, second by Stonegrove, to waive the second reading of ordinance number 1134. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Silvera? I need to ask for opposed. Move for the adoption. You, go. you need to ask for opposed. Oh, any opposed? <laughs> No. Okay. All right. Motion carried. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would now like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number 1134 as read by title. Mrs. Stonegrove. Second. Okay. It's been motioned by Silvera, second by Stonegrove to adopt ordinance number 1134. Uh, Director Maloney, roll call. Faria. Lewis. Yes. Silvera. Yes. Stonegrove. Yes. Sawalta. Yes. Okay, motion carried. Uh, let's go on to item number two, City Council Resolution number 5697, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of special events. And again, just a little side note, you are to meet with the, uh, the chief on every event to get an estimate based on uh, volunteerism or no volunteerism. Mr. Severa. Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion to adopt City Council Resolution Number 5697, as read by title. Okay, would you read the whole? Okay, thing. establishing the permit fees for the administration and issuance of special events. Thank you, Mrs. Stonegrove. Second. Okay, motion by Silvera, second by Stonegrove, uh, to approve City Council Resolution Number 5697, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of special events. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. All right, it's we've been at this for two hours. I think we deserve a break. Real quick. Oh, something uh, else? Just in the in the order of expediency, is there a way that we could um, skip to item D, and so that we can, Mr. Mr. Uh, Faria can come back into the meeting and we can keep progressing on after the. You know, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we'd have to. Uh, can you make a run, make a motion? Well, as, as I mean, we're going to. Uh, I'll make the motion to table item D's public hearing. Well, why don't you make a motion to move item D up to where uh, B should be, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll take that action. Okay. Okay. So first, I'll make the motion to move item D to the place of item B. Okay. And do I have a second? Stonegrove? Second. Okay, motion by Silvera, second by uh, Stonegrove to move item D up to item B. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Mrs. Rivera. Mr. Mayor, if we could, I'd like to make a motion that the new that item D, the receive public comment and consideration of adopting proposed ordinance for regulation of farmer markets located in Title IX and Chapter Three of the Los Spanish Municipal Code be tabled to the October Seven. 7th Council meeting. Mrs. Stonegrove? Second. And it just if I can give a quick explanation to that is, is the, the city manager and the city attorney are going to meet with the Ag Commissioner and become a little bit more familiar and educate themselves on farmers markets so that we know exactly what we're dealing with and so I don't I want to come up with the right decision not a rush decision so if we could table that that would be great. Okay. Actually if there's anyone here that well, gets back, I'm going to open a public hearing. I want to talk about that. Before he, yeah, oh, before okay. he does that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I am going to do, and uh, I would like to open the public hearing to receive public comment and consideration of adopting a proposed ordinance for regulation of a farmer's market located at title, uh, in Title IX and Chapter 3 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. And this is just opening the public hearing. We will continue the public hearing. Uh, and to, would you add at the end of that too, to continue the public hearing, if that's okay? Uh, if anyone would like to speak on this now, they can, but it's not your final say, and you, and on October 7th, we're gonna continue that public hearing and open it up again. So if anyone would like to speak on the form, formerly item D, now the new B, would you please come forward? After that long-winded, thank you. <laughs> uh, I will now close the public hearing, bring it back to council level, and Severa, would you add that? One piece. Yes, if I could table item D to the um, October the 7th meeting as well as the public hearing. Okay, Mrs. Stonegrove? Second. Okay, it's uh, been moved by Mr. Silvera, seconded by Mrs. Stonegrove uh, to continue formally the item D, public hearing on the farmer's market, now the new B, and to continue the public hearing to October 7th. 7th. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? None carry. Okay? We're going to take a 10 minute break or so.
Okay, we took a little bit longer than 10 minutes, but we're back. Okay, why don't we go on to, uh, let's see here, we are at public hearing to receive public comment and consideration of adopting a proposed ordinance for the regulation of block parties located in Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Los Banos Municipal Code. B, well, it's actually, it would be the new C. Um, C1 and 2. And it is... Yeah. Okay. Ordinance number 1136, adding Article 43, Chapter 3 to Title 9 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code relating to residential neighborhood block parties. Item 2, City Council Resolution number 5698, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of residential neighborhood block parties. And let's go to uh, Senior Planner Elms. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. So uh, a background on this particular ordinance, we did, once again, we discussed this back on September 2nd, but currently there is no uniform process to review proposed residential neighborhood block parties. It does require temporary closure of residential neighborhood streets. Uh, and what our proposed ordinance uh, includes, it defines what a block party is. It establishes then if you are a block party, then you must obtain a block party permit. It creates an application submittal timeline, so it's not less than 21 days and no more than 90 days before the event. It has regulations and conditions of approval within. It has a requirement uh, that the applicant sign an indemnity agreement because it is on public property. The event must also obtain liability insurance. And then in the event that the um, applicant disagrees with the decision of the Community and Economic Development Department, uh, they do have the opportunity to appeal to the Planning Commission. The application processing fee uh, that staff is proposing, once again, it is, it's still $150. This is a minimal fee uh, for, to review the application, to analyze the site in accordance with our ordinance, to route the application to our public works department, our public safety departments, which are police and fire, and then those departments to provide comments to the community and economic development department, and then for the department to issue or deny the permit. So with that, I kept it pretty short and brief because we did discuss at length on um, September 2nd. Um, but with that, I'm uh, asking that the City Council adopt Ordinance Number 1136, adding Article 43 of Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Los Banos Municipal Code relating to block parties. And then adopt Resolution Number 5698, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of residential neighborhood block party permits. And with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. And before we, uh, we go to uh, questions and then the public hearing, I just wanted everyone to know that Mr. Free at 917 joined us again for this item. And he will be here for the remainder of the meeting. Okay. So uh, if we could, um, uh, if we could, uh, do I have any questions from council at this time? All right, what I'd like to do now is open up the public hearing on ordinance number 1136 and city council resolution number 5698 uh, as read by title. Is there anyone who would like to speak on those? Okay. Um, Kathy Ballard, resident of the city of Los Banos. I'm going to stop talking for my, my customers and neighbors and everything else because I seem to get beat up a lot. But I have a question that was brought up by one of my neighbors who was planning on having a block party. Um, contacted her insurance company and I know that you have to have a million dollars and the city of Los Manos has to be named as additional insured. Um, their insurance company refused to do it mm -hmm. because she wasn't the sole per per person who was giving the party. It was a whole block. Um, that they could do a certificate of insurance showing that they were insured. But to list the city of Los Banos as an additional insured because there was no control by one sole per person, mm -hmm. they denied being able to do that. It's a problem. Um, I just want to know um, how they might solve it. 
in regards to what the city needs and what a neighborhood person can do. Um, the reason I asked that is because she said, well, if I can't get an additional insured, I'm just going to have it, put a car at the end of my street, and have the party and hope the police department doesn't patrol that that day. So it's just a question that was brought up, and so I am now bringing it to you since this is something they need an answer to. Okay, we're going to have Mr. Vaughn for an answer. Ask Mr. Vaughn for an answer. First of all, this is a requirement of our insurance that anyone uh, having an activity on a public street have insurance in the limit amount that's in set forth in the ordinance and that the city be named as an additional insured. What your neighbor friend was probably doing is trying to tag it on to her homeowner's insurance and they're probably a little trickier. There are block party special event, one day insurance policies for probably less than $100 she could obtain and meet all of the requirements of the ordinance. The, there's really no there's no ability of the city to undo that requirement. That's a requirement of our insurance. If we don't require that of the uh, person giving the block party, our insurance will not cover us if there's some some liability that happens during the block party. Kathy, the, the RMA risk management and risk management are the ones that insure us based on uh, on, on, on factors uh, and, and procedures that we present. So uh, we'll lose our insurance. Come, come to the microphone, please. You still have a minute. Yeah. I just didn't know where to send her because she did go to her homeowner carrier and they denied it because, and I can explain, you know, why they did answer. it. I understand it okay. because you have 10 people and is it all your liability? No. So you have to get a policy, from what I understand, probably that as an applicant of all 10 residents that are doing it, um, and get the one-day insurance. Okay. Which I totally, and I know the city has to be covered. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just trying to help them be able to do things legally. And you did. That's what, Thank I you. Want. That's what I'm here for. Okay. <laughs> Good you. night. Thank you. All right. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to speak at the public hearing? Not seeing or hearing anyone, I will now close the public hearing, bring it back to council level, and council members, do you have any questions? Or recommendations, or uh, motions? Mrs. Stonegrove. I would move to waive the second reading of ordinance number 1136, adding article 43, chapter three, title, to title nine of the Las Vegas Municipal Code relating to residential neighborhood block parties. Okay, do I have a second? Mrs. Lewis. I'll second the motion. Okay, motion by um, Stonegrove, second by Lewis, ordinate, to approve ordinance, ordinate, yes, to uh, waive the second reading of ordinance number 1136. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? None. Carried. Mrs. Stonegrove? I would move to adopt ordinance number 1136 as read. Mrs. Lewis? Second. Okay, motion to adopt ordinance number 1136, motion by Stonegrove, second by Lewis. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Silvera? Yes. Stonegrove? Yes. Walker? Yes. Motion carried. Mrs. Stonegrove? And I have just a question about this. Res is this resolution number 5698, establishing the permit fees? Because I have the old. Okay. I move to adopt City Council Resolution Number 5698, establishing permit fees for the administration and issuance of residential neighborhood block parties. Mrs. Lewis? Second. Motion by Stonegrove, second by Lewis, to approve City Council Resolution Number 5698, as read by title. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None carried. Let's go on to the new D, and that is... Public hearing to receive public comment and consideration of adopting a proposed ordinance for regulation for zoning code appeals located in Title IX, Chapter 3, the Los Angeles Municipal Code, uh, ordinance number 1137, uh, adopting revisions to the zoning code, standardizing the appeals process by amending Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. Uh, let's go to a Senior Planner Elms. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, so tonight, to give you some background on our zoning code standardized um, appeals process, how we got to this point, um, back in 2010, the city did ad adopt a comprehensive zoning code update. Um, but at that time, we did not address a consistent uniform procedure for appeals. So in various parts of the code, the Community and Economic Development Director um, would make the decisions and either could appeal up to the city manager or to the planning commission. It wasn't very consistent. Um, so going through this process of uh, housekeeping and updating our zoning code ordinances uh, we discovered that some articles have separate or different appeal processes and we needed a standard standardized procedure for that so we presented this proposed ordinance to the Planning Commission and they reviewed it on August 12 2015 uh, with a recommendation of approval to the City Council on this proposed ordinance the proposed ordinance uh, does provide for a standardized appeal process through the zoning code and sets forth that any dissatisfied person with the community and economic development director's decision or the planning commission can file a written notice within 10 days of the decision um, to the city clerk and if it is a decision of the community and economic development director uh, they the planning commission would be the appellate body and then if it's a decision of the planning commission the city council would be the appellate body um, for any of those decisions in the final making body so with that staff is recommending that the city council adopt ordinance number 1137 adopting revisions to the zoning code standardizing the appeals process and that concludes my presentation i'm here to answer any of your questions okay all right um we are now at the stage of uh, is there anyone at the city council who would like to ask a question at this time before i open up the public hearing okay let's go to the public hearing and to receive public comment consideration of adopting proposed ordinance for regulation of zoning appeals uh, zoning code appeals located in title nine chapter three of the los Angeles municipal code ordinance number one one three seven is read by title is there anyone who would like to speak on that item not seeing or hearing anyone i will now close the public hearing bring it back to council level and council any questions recommendations mrs lewis Yes, if there are no other questions of council members, I'd like to um, make a recommendation that ordinance number 1137, adopting uh, revisions to the zoning code, standardizing the appeal process by amending Title IX, Chapter 3 of the Los Banos Municipal Code uh, to uh, waive the second reading. Okay, do I have a, a second? Mr. Silvera? I'll second. Motion by Lewis, second by Silvera, uh, to waive the second reading of ordinance number 1137 is read by title. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? None carried. Mrs. Lewis. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion uh, for ordinance number 1137 uh, to be adopted as read by title. Okay, Mr. Silvera. Second. Okay, motion by uh, Lewis, second by Silvera to uh, adopt uh, ordinance number 1137 is read by title. Roll call vote. Director Maloney? Faria? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Silvera? Yes. Stonebrook? Yes. Peralta? Yes. Motion carried. <coughs> we are now back to E, which is E. Okay. And let's go on to public hearing. To receive public comment and consideration of amendments to the City Fire Prevention Code ordinance as it pertains to allowing for the exemption permit to be issued to an eligible organization for the purpose of sponsoring or continuing a 4th of July fireworks display. Item E1, ordinance number 1138, amending uh, number 11, uh, amendment number 11 to the California Fire Code 2013 uh, edition set forth in section 4-3-4-3.07 of the Los Manos Municipal Code. And this is a first reading and introduction, and let's go to Mr. Fachin. Yes, Chief. Oh, Chief Marison. All right, we'll go to him. Wait a minute, okay, okay. all right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 
What you have before you tonight is an ordinance that amends our existing amendment to the fire code. Back in 2005, ordinance number 1025 established that we could um, set an ordinance to sell, possess, and discharge safe and sane fireworks in the city of Los Banos. When that ordinance came into effect 10 years ago, we established a mechanism to where we could issue permits for uh, local nonprofit organizations to sell permits out of their booths. There was also a permit that was set aside specifically for the Chamber of Commerce that they would be able to use that permit specifically to raise money for a public fireworks display annually. That worked very well up until last year where the Chamber decided that uh, it was not financially feasible for them to continue that practice. So coming back, speaking to the city manager and some city council members, we would like to bring this ordinance before you so that we can once again entertain the fact that if a nonprofit organization approaches us and asks to do the, basically the same exact thing that the Chamber of Commerce was proposing, that we would have the ability to enter into an MOU and issue them that one variance permit so that um, we can once again enjoy a, another public works or uh, public display of aerial fireworks in the city of Los Banos. So the idea is that um, we have already been approached by a group of, uh, of citizens that represent a number of different organizations in the city. Uh, if this is successful in passing, then we will enter into a memorandum of understanding or an agree agreement with that group for probably a three-year period, depending on um, you know how the city manager would like to proceed forward with guidance from our legal counsel. So I would be happy to answer any questions, but that's the short version of what we're trying to do is basically take the Chamber of Commerce name off this permit and be able to uh, negotiate with future nonprofit organizations to provide this service to the city. Okay. Mr. Kerrigan. Chief, can you explain, uh, just so that when we go through this process of selecting the seven booths plus one, we were at six plus one, but we're going to seven booths plus one, and I know it's really simple, but can you explain it for everybody so that they won't be confused next time around? Yeah, the existing point? ordinance says that we can issue one fireworks booth permit per 5,000 population. So we had our... our we had always issued seven, which was six plus one. Well, in the meantime, our population grew to where we're over 35,000. So when the chamber withdrew their ability to take that permit, I decided at that time that our population justified seven booths, so I would just leave it at seven booths. Uh, the ordinance gives me authorization to do that. So now that we're at 35, that says seven booths, plus this one exempt, so that will take us to eight booths, um, which is one more than we've ever had. Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions for um, Chief Marison? Right? Uh, yes. One. Go ahead. I was trying to get to that ordinance right quickly. Um, I, I just, let's see, I just had a question on, um, I'm sorry, just give me a second here. Since you're flipping through pages, I won't call it a senior moment. <laughs> it is. Okay. <laughs> well, let me see if I could pull it from my memory, Chief, because I'm, uh, I was doing some other stuff and I didn't turn to that page properly. Uh, there was a section in there that referred to, um, one of them referred to you having the discretion on the permit, and then on another portion it said that the city manager had the discretion of uh, giving out the permit. So I think what that was referring to is that the current ordinance states that the organization, the nonprofit that's applying for the permit must be in place for two years prior to the application. And what that does is it prevents somebody from just throwing together a nonprofit organization coming down a month later applying for a fireworks booth and, and selling. Uh, what 
gives the city manager the authorization to do is when a nonprofit organization approaches us in an interest in getting that one exempt booth, then we have the ability to waive that um, to uh, enter into an MOU with the organization. And the reason we did that is, frankly, um, none of the existing organizations have came up, we're not going to allow an existing organization like, let's say, um, Seroptimus to be exempt. This organization has to be organized just to raise money for the fireworks, the public fireworks display. So it is quite possibly going to be an organization that is put together now. And so it wouldn't have the two years to be in existence prior to July. Okay. So it doesn't mean that because they get that booth that they're responsible for paying for all of the fireworks. Uh, yeah, it does. does. Okay, so, it so does. they will be responsible to put on the whole show as well as having that exempt booth to pay towards the show. Yeah, and that's been, we had a pretty intense discussion with the city manager and the individuals that are interested in doing this is that um, the, we will, through the MOU, uh, have ways of holding them to the fire that if they're selling fireworks for this one purpose then um, you know they're gonna have to follow through with that yeah. if that does that answer your question uh, yeah and they understand that there's going to be other donations involved from the community or from other organizations in the community to make up the difference in a uh, twelve hundred dollar a minute fireworks show. Uh, that's why the chamber backed out is because they couldn't sell enough to support the annual fireworks show so he understands or they understand as a group that they're going to have some other um, f funding that they have to come up with to complete okay. this task. Yeah. Th those were the two questions. That I had. Thank you. This You're is welcome. like selling chocolates and then the money doesn't go to the organization or where it intends to go and then they can't keep the money. Right. Okay. okay. So um, any other questions? Okay. Scott, question? So then, um, it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a group that has to be formed in this. If there's a group out there that said, hey, we want to take this on, and I'm, I'm Elks or, or Lions or, or whoever, if they want to just take this on, they could still apply for this exempt permit. They could apply for the exempt permit, but we will not allow them to apply for one of the other sevens at the same time. Exactly. We don't. We don't want somebody to get two permits. Gotcha. One organization to get two permits. Okay. So it doesn't have to be a organization that was just put together to put on the fireworks show. If there is a group that so felt that they could take it on, they could do that. Yeah, but they wouldn't be eligible for another permit. Exactly. And then. And then. That's, that'll be handled by you and the city manager, that yes. group that comes forward. We'll evaluate them, um, come up with an MOU that works for everyone involved, and then proceed with issuing them the permit at our discretion. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, okay, motions? Motions? Yeah, we had the public hearing. I think we did, yes? Okay. No, 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 we didn't? No, we didn't. Any the public hearing? Nope. Did I miss? Oh, that's right. You asked a question. Okay. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> I'll be darned. All right. Let's go to the public hearing to receive public comment and consideration of amendments to the City Fire Prevention Code ordinance as it pertains to allowing an exempt permit to be issued to an eligible organization for the purpose of sponsoring or continuing to a 4th of July fireworks display. Ordinance number 1138, amending uh, number 11 to the uh, California Fire Code 2013 edition, set forth in section 4-3.07 uh, of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Kathy Ballard, resident of this podium. Um, I just want to make um, a comment in regards to the amount of booths that you have. 
Um, I would suggest if it's one for five thousand and we have thirty-five thousand, you should leave it at six plus one, so they all have a better chance of raising the funds that is needed to put on the firework booth. Because okay. you only have so many residents buying it, and if you go to eight, it just means less for each booth, and so they don't have as good a chance of making that twenty-six thousand dollars that they're going to need. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, we'll now close the public hearing, bring it back to council level, and Mrs. Stonegrove. Um, if there's no further discussion, I would move to waive the first reading of ordinance number 1138, amending amendment number 11 to the California Fire Code 2013 edition set forth in section 4-3.07 of the Los Banos Municipal Code. Okay, Mr. Silvera. I'll second. Okay, motion by Stone Grove, second by Silvera. Um, I will tell you that uh, the request that you made, uh, it's kind of too late for this year because uh, because what's happening is that all notices have gone out and I think, have we selected everybody yet? No, we select at the end of this month. End of this month. Yeah, but, but we did not make any changes yeah. to the ordinance right. regulating the amount of permits. That's something Correct. that was adopted 10 years ago, yes. so that's remaining the same. Yeah. That isn't changed, it's just that our population has grown, so yeah. it justified an extra permit. Right, and, and what we've done is that's something way in advance the council could consider, but I think with less than a month, uh, with, with 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 what's happening, I think that's kind of short notice to probably cut somebody off. I was just looking at eight times Okay. Yeah. And we got. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But thank you for the comment. And I just wanted to kind of give you an explanation that it's kind of too late to cut them off. Okay. Motioned by Stone Grove, second by Silvera, to approve City Council Resolution Number Five uh, Seven Fifty Seven Hundred. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, where, where, where am I? Oh, one, I'm sorry. Ordinance number. Oh, God. I'm, I'm just, I apologize. I apologize. Ordinance number 1138. And it's been motioned by Stone Grove, seconded by Silvera, to waive the first reading. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? None. Carried. Mrs. Stonegrove. I move to introduce ordinance number 1138 as read by title. Mr. Silvera. Second. Motion by Stonegrove. Second by Silvera for the introduction of ordinance number 1138. Uh, roll call. Maria. Yes. Lewis. Yes. Silvera. Yes. Stonegrove. Yes. Salalta. Yes. All, uh, uh, motion carried. Okay, let's go on to item F, public hearing. To receive public comment and consideration of a conditional use permit to allow the use of a type 41 alcohol license for the on sale of beer and wine in conjunction with an eating establishment, JNN Restaurant, located at 933 6th Street, Suite B, APN 025-241-013. And at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Pro Tem Faria to now take the center seat because I have a conflict. I have property within 500 feet, and so I will need to excuse myself. You're welcome. <laughs> he was supposed to. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> we are at yeah. Yeah. item F. So item F, to receive public comment in consideration of a conditional use permit to allow the use of a type 41 alcohol license for the on sale of beer and wine in conjunction with an eating establishment, JNN Restaurant, located at 933 6th Street, Suite B, APN 025-241-013. And we will go to Senior Planner Elms. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Faria. 
So uh, JNN Restaurant, it's conditional use permit number 2015-09. Uh, their proposal is for a Type 41 alcohol license. This would be for the on sale of barren wine in conjunction with an eating establishment. They're proposing an establishment um, that uh, sells American and Mexican food. The location is at 9336 Street, Suite B, and it is uh, highlighted for in yellow, but it's pointed out for you with that arrow in red in the downtown area. According to CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, this project is categorically exempt per Article 19, Section 15301, and that it is an existing facility and no uh, expansion or um, any other uh, environmentally significant uh, would happen on this um, piece of property. It is uh, within census track 22.01 and currently there are eight on sale licenses within this census tract. Uh, according to the municipal code there are general criteria that a conditional use permit must be able to uh, meet and the city council must make those findings prior to approving uh, the conditional use permit. So the first finding is that uh, the proposed use and project is consistent with the city of Las Vegas' general plan and our municipal code. And the evidence for this finding is that the site is designated mixed use and it is zoned mixed use and commercial uses uh, are included within that particular zoning district which restaurant establishments with alcohol are permitted. And two, uh, that the proposed use or project will not be a nuisance or detrimental to the public health, safety, morals, comfort, and general welfare of the persons residing or working in the neighborhood of such proposed use. And the finding that we're asking the City Council to make here is that the proposed use will be conducted within a, an established downtown business district and will not result in significant operational changes to the existing commercial area. And the area's function and character is mixed use, which includes commercial restaurants that do serve alcohol. And then the third general finding is that the proposed use is compatible with the adjacent uses, properties, and neighborhoods, and will not be detrimental or injurious to property Im improvements in the neighborhood or to the general welfare of the city. And the finding that staff is asking the city council make here is that the proposed use will be conducted within the downtown business district and will not result in significant operational changes to the existing commercial area. So then the municipal code goes on to state that if the conditional use permit is for alcoholic beverages, there are specific findings and there's four findings that the council must make in, in that specific uh, instance. One, that the proposal will not contribute to undue proliferation of such uses in an area where additional ones would be undesirable with consideration given to the area's function and character, problems of crime and loitering and traffic problems and capacity. And the finding that staff is asking that the City Council make here is that, um, as stated within your staff report, the number of on-sale licenses in this census tract is currently eight. And the addition of one more license will not contribute to the proliferation of alcohol sales as the on-sale of barren wine will be in conjunction with food. Uh, this census tract is not overly concentrated with uh, on-sale beer and wine alcohol licenses. It's a fairly large census tract that does encompass the entire downtown district as well as the northern section of uh, the Pacheco Corridor from um, really Mercy Springs all the way down to Badger Flat Road. And then two, that the proposal will not adversely affect adjacent or nearby churches, temples or synagogues, public parochial or private elementary, junior high or high schools, public parks or recreation centers, or public or parochial playgrounds. And the finding that staff is asking the city council make here is that there are no such types of uses in the immediate area. The closest school is approximately 650 feet away which is Westside Elementary, and the nearest church is approximately 400 feet north of this project site. It's even further than that if you were to take the direct um, travel, the route of travel to that particular um, church site. Uh, essentially, 400 feet would be me measuring directly from the building over across buildings to the church site. So there are restaurants within the vicinity, um, as stated, with a 
Type 41 license, which do operate harmoniously with the surrounding area. And we are asking that the City Council consider the surrounding area and nearby uses and determine that there is no evidence of adverse impacts to adjacent or nearby churches, temples, or synagogues, nearby parks, recreation centers, or playgrounds. The third finding is that the proposal will not interfere with the movement of people along an important pedestrian street. And we're asking that the City Council determine that the consumption of alcohol will only be allowed inside the premises and the use will be regulated by the City, State, and Federal regulations. And then the last finding is that where the proposed use is in close proximity to residential uses and especially in bedroom windows, the use will be limited in hours of operation or designed operated so as to avoid the disruption of resident sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. And the evidence here is that the hours of operation would start after 7 a.m. and they would end at 10 p.m. The consumption of alcohol will not be allowed outside of the premises per the conditions of approval and also our city ordinance. The nearest residential window is located at least 100 feet away from the front entrance to the restaurant. And based upon these considerations, we're asking that the city council find that there is no evidence that the use will cause disruption of sleep. So this is um, a photo of the front of the business. This is at 933 6th Street, Suite B. This was a former location of uh, Pierre's, uh, the deli downtown. It's right next to the office city and uh, Una Bella Salon. So the public comment, uh, public hearing notice was published in the Las Vegas Enterprise and mailed out to the 300 foot radius on September 4th, 2015. And as of today's date, no comments have been received. So with that, staff is uh, asking that the City Council adopt resolution number 5700, approving conditional use permit number 2015-09 for JNN Restaurant. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Stacy. Uh, we'll now move to the public hearing. Uh, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the public who would like to address the council on this item, item F? Seeing no one, we'll move, close the public hearing. And if uh, council has any uh, commentary or uh, motion, um, we'll entertain that at this at this time. Mr. Silvera. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, if there are no questions, I'd like to make a motion to adopt City Council Resolution number 5700, approving conditional use permit number 2015-09 for the on sale of beer and wine for JNN Restaurant located at 933 6th Street, Suite B. Ms. Stonegrove? Second. I have a motion by Mr. Silvera and a second by Ms. Stonegrove to approve City Council Resolution number 5700. Any discussion? No discussion. We'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Faria. Okay. All right. We are at um, number nine, community and economic development presentation. Continued from September 2nd, 2015, City Council meeting, and we will go to Senior Planner Elms. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this presentation, I just want to uh, be able to give the status to the City Council of where the Community and Economic Development Department, what we've done so far this year, what we're working on, and what we're anticipating for in the future. Um, so a, a project that's happening in town that really has, it's not a city project, but it does show uh, great progress for our community is the Courthouse Project. It is a two-story structure on G Street, uh, which is west of Mercy Springs Road. And they are uh, moving quite nicely in the construction process. This was the first day that uh, the crane was out there and they were um, putting up the walls out on um, the courthouse site. 
this particular um, project does bring development to the area. It will have potential development with professional offices um, as well as uh, coffee shops and deli shops for the jurors. Um, and the city is anticipating um, complete construction of, around the summer of 2016. So a very exciting project for the city of Los Banos. The next project um, that we see going around, uh, happening right now in town is the junior high. Uh, the new junior high is located on Prairie Springs and Badger Flat Road. And it's anticipated that uh, construction would be completed in August of 2016. And this is a photo of the um, first two-story classroom that's been constructed so far. It is right off of Badger Flat Road. And also very exciting uh, to see a new junior high on the south side of Pacheco Boulevard. And um, that construction crew is uh, working quite nicely. Uh, we have not received any issues from the neighborhood, but they have been uh, notifying the neighbors as well as the city each time. Um, construction work is to happen early on in the morning hours and um, we have a, a nice relationship with the school district on this particular project. So another uh, project that I did want to mention for you and really I do want to cover the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, the closure of Kmart is um, um, something that's uh, come out publicly recently and um, the city of Los Banos is anticipating that the store would close around November 15th um, of this year and we are currently working with the property owner and we're trying to um, help them secure access to the site from State Route 152. Uh, they're currently working with uh, two tenants that they're hoping to occupy the existing Kmart um, in order to occupy the empty building once Kmart vacates. Um, but in order to secure those tenants, they've told the city that they would need to secure access off of 152. Now, we are trying to work with them. Um, we've uh, coordinated meetings with Caltrans. Uh, there are some obstacles, though, uh, that we would like the public to know about. Um, there is a um, easement. The Union Pacific Rail Line still owns an easement that runs on the frontage of that particular property off of uh, 152 Pacheco Boulevard, as well as there's a Caltrans Corporation Yard and um, the intersection of Mercy Springs and 152 also being in close proximity. So it's all of these issues that we're trying to work with um, and just working with the agencies of the Union Pacific uh, Railroad as well as Caltrans, um, getting them all together. The city is really trying to, to be the middleman and, and uh, coordinate all of these connections. Um, but it, it, we are hopeful that we will be able to um, secure access there at 152 in order to be able to secure uh, new tenants for this location and we're doing whatever we can in our power to help the property owners. So future retail, I just wanted to hit um, upon that. We've had some uh, new site plans come before the Planning Commission in the last couple of months, um, one of which is the 99 cent store, and this would be on the southeast corner of Ortigolita Road and Pacheco Boulevard. And this is the elevations here. And another future retail is the Prime Shine Car Wash. That would be um, just east of H Street on Pacheco Boulevard. And um, another um, couple of projects that have recently just gone to the Planning Commission, I don't have eleva elevations for you, is the Eakins property. It's a 5,000 square foot industrial building off of Commerce Way. And then uh, we just did a design review last Wednesday with the uh, Planning Commission for a sleep train mattress retailer. And that will be then going to the Planning Commission this next coming Wednesday for a final site plan review approval. And then Mi Barrio at 403 North Mercy Springs is um, proposing an expansion of their store, essentially doubling their size. Uh, both very promising um, promise, uh, projects and do show that uh, retail is starting to come back in Las Banas. We see a little bit of a trickle come through. Um, I also wanted to highlight our design review process for the City Council. So that was an ordinance that did take effect uh, about last year and we're really seeing this 
year in 2015 these projects um, go through this process and and see how it unfolds from beginning to end and um, one of the highest compliments that our department received was from the owners of Prime Shine. He wrote an email um, that he was actually kind of skeptical at the beginning of an additional process to go through this design review. But after going through it, just the positive feedback that he received as well as uh, the direction that he was given from the Planning Commission helped his process and he felt that that was immensely helpful. So um, from being a skeptic, he is now a believer in our design review process. And I do um, actually receive a lot of positive feedback from the applicants, um, particularly the architects that are receiving this feedback early on in the project versus at the end at a public hearing when the planning commission is trying to redesign their project. That's all happening in a study session where there's open dialogue between the architect and the planning commission. So it's uh, coming out to be a really um, helpful process. The next project I wanted to highlight is the industrial park and what the city is doing right now um, in this project. So I'd say daily, uh, myself and the city manager, we do spend um, is quite a bit of time each day on the industrial park. It's not quite evident that the public would see, but we are working on this in the background. Um, so just to let the public know that this project is still one of our number one priorities, and we do work on this every day. Um, where we're at right now in the status of our industrial park is we are working with a planning firm on designing a conceptual site plan. Um, what we've come to so far is about three um, conceptual site plans, we've pretty much narrowed it down to one. And this would be uh, basically what the city manager and I um, have been reviewing is these land uses, uh, which really consist of warehousing, flex space, uh, business park, commercial land uses, and just the placement of those and determining the square footage. And that determination of the square footage is really important because that helps us prepare a water supply assessment to determine whether this project is feasible. So if we can have uh, a determination that there is um, sufficient groundwater, then we can move on to our next studies. Currently, right now, with um, the proposal that we're looking at our conceptual site plan, we're at about 17.1 million square feet out of the entire 1,800 um, acres of our industrial park area. Stacy, it's been, it's been a long time since I talked to Mark Hendrickson about this, but do you know the county's existing inventory of vacant space? Do you know that figure? Just for perspective, I know that 17 million is off the chart. I mean, is it three million, two million? I mean, I know it's seventeen yeah, percent when I they mean, just, calculate it all together, which is extremely low. Um, when we receive leads, and I've explained this to the council before, so uh, the county is our contact person for leads. These are um, industrial businesses that are looking to locate in the Central Valley. Los Banos, I can't even uh, respond to maybe one out of twenty leads right. that we receive because we don't have the capacity and we don't have the shovel ready project. So this gives us inventory. Yes. And a lot of it. Ample. I got you. To be able to compete with the counties north of us, Stanislaus and San Joaquin. Um, so in the downtown, I also wanted to highlight there uh, what we're doing. Um, we focused last year in 2014 on 6th Street, and this year in 2015 we've taken a big focus on I Street, and we've done a business walk in June. We did speak to the I Street businesses. Um, it was myself, uh, my planning technician Sandra uh, Benetti, uh, the city manager uh, Steve Kerrigan, and our mayor um, Mike Valalta. We went out to all the businesses and spoke to them, just introduced ourselves, um, let them know that there are organizations that they can be a part of. They can be a part of the chamber and the downtown association we also ask that they take ownership of just their storefronts and if everybody helped out with just their storefronts uh, we could improve the way that our downtown looks and also a part of our uh, focus of downtown and particularly I Street um, in working with the um, code enforcement division of our police department we did second unit inspections and these are all of the units that um, 
are uh, the motels on um, the second story. So you have the retail on the bottom, the second story uh, residential units on top. We went to, through several of um, these types of second units downtown. Uh, the Code Enforcement Division um, looked for uh, safety and habitability of those units and it was a joint effort between the fire department, code enforcement, um, community and economic development and the building department and um, we went through all of those units and then code enforcement wrote a letter to let those uh, property owners know um, what they needed to do in order to bring those units into compliance and they are currently working with those property owners um, to finalize those items that they needed to do in order to um, bring those properties under code. So another um, important project I wanted to highlight is um, a project that the Economic Development Advisory Commission is working on. It's our downtown murals. And if you can recall, several years ago, we did some fundraising. We sold some historical calendars. Um, and this was to create historical murals downtown. Um, the EDAC, the Economic Development Advisory Commission, uh, did select three locations. And the first location for this mural would be um, on K Street and 6th Street. It would be the northeast corner of K and 6th Street. And this is just a preliminary sketch of um, what the artist Ann Whitehurst is working on. Uh, just to give you an idea of what EDAC is looking at. Um, that particular corner historically was a uh, livery stable and um, EDAC, um, their direction was that they wanted to represent, have this first mural represent historically what that uh, corner uh, was back in the, 1800, the late 1800s, early 1900s of Los Banas. There's also a unique story of um, the McCarthy livery stable that then was still sold to the Arecas and the Areca family still has their flower shop near there. Uh, so a very interesting story of how um, that corner was developed and shaped out. A very um, exciting news that I wanted to share with you is that we did receive um, a letter on Friday that we are awarded the CDBG grant for code enforcement. So back in April, if uh, you recall, um, a proposal came before you and it's community development block grant. Um, it was for code enforcement and we were going to be able to um, with that money hire a contracted code enforcement officer to be able to help our um, existing division. And uh, on Friday, it was about 11-ish or so, Steve came over to me and showed me the letter. It was exciting news. Um, Sandra Benetti did a lot of great work in putting that application together, um, and we were successful. So we're very excited about this particular grant. Um, we should be working in the next couple of weeks through a checklist with CDBG. Um, and the total amount is uh, $322,500. 300000 of that will go to um, the, the Code Enforcement Officer Division and then um, $22,500 is for the general administration of the grant. So very exciting for us. And along the same lines of that, that particular grant, CDBG, we are still looking for an 8 to 10 unit apartment complex. We are preparing ourselves for the next NOFA uh, 2016, which is Notice of Funding Availability from um, the Housing and Community Development Department, HCD, um, which is the state. So right now we've been contacting brokers and realtors, um, letting you know that we're still interested, and um, although the market has not changed. So if you recall, back in um, April, we did um, come to the council with the activities that we were going to be applying for. At that time, we were only able to apply for code enforcement because we were anticipating applying for an 8 to 10 unit apartment complex, but the market uh, where property owners had bought those particular multifamily units, it was so high. Um, and the market dropped that those units have not quite come back to the same rate that those property owners had bought those units at. So the market hasn't changed very much. Uh, we're still hoping though that a particular property owner would be willing to um, negotiate with us and we would be able to secure an 8 to 10 unit complex in the future. Um, I, next I wanted to highlight our residential history. 
uh, and go on to residential permits and, and what we see happening there. Uh, back in 2008, and between 2008 and 2012, there were no new single family residential permits issued. So there was four years there was zero permits issued. Then we saw in 2013, 20 single family residential permits were issued to Anderson Homes, which was the Teal Landing subdivision. But this was not a good indicator of where the market was at. That particular development agreement for that subdivision was expiring and they were trying to pull their permits as quickly as possible in order to lock in their low impact fee rate. So it was not a good indicator of where we were at the market. Um, but what we saw in 2014 um, did give us some hope. In 2014, we did issue 37 single family residential permits. Those were to UC Construction for the Orchard Terrace 2 project and Valley Vanguard properties to Regency Park. And at that point in 2014, what we saw the developers doing was really testing out the market and trying to find their price point of where um, single family residential permits would be. This is a aerial map of where we see construction happening right now. So we have um, really four active uh, subdivisions. They are uh, Regency Park, Vineyards 17 and 18. We're wrapping up at Orchard Terrace 2. We see construction happening right now in Southbrook, which is Anderson. And within the next couple of months, we're going to be seeing some permits issued at Sandstone, uh, which is Villages 3, right off of Badger Flat. So we'll have uh, two projects on the south side and three subdivisions on the north side. This is an aerial, well, it's a photo of, um, this is Vineyard 17 and 18, and just looking, and it's hard to see here, but um, when you drive through these subdivisions, you see just rows of sold signs, which is promising and very exciting for the city of Las Minas to actually be seeing the market activated. So I did want to go through 2015 and what we see occurring in the market right now. Um, we have issued 90 permits, and that is from January 1st to August 31st. Uh, they are to UC Construction, Valley Vanguard, and Anderson Homes. Uh, very promising since uh, January 1, uh, it was about, Steve and I sat down and said, well, let's make some projections for the year. Let's see where we're going to be at. That also helps us with the budgeting um, for the fiscal year, uh, where we think we will be. and. Steve and I said, uh, conservatively 80, but maybe max 100. And we really wanted to stick with those numbers. And it's very promising that as of August 31st, we're already at 90. And we're entering the last quarter of uh, the year. And there's still plenty of time for developers to pull permits. And we're pretty confident that we're going to reach 100, um, maybe 100, 125. So that's very exciting for the city of Los Banas. And out of that, we finaled 52 homes, which is about 57%. That's a really good indicator of the market as well, that we don't have, um, we're, we're about halfway there. But as they're being built, they're being sold. So. Um, what that means to the city, we receive the impact fees once they're occupied or once they're finaled. So we are receiving impact fees. Uh, we're able to kind of uh, grow our um, impact fee accounts to be able to serve the community better. Also, what this means in uh, the projection of residential permits is really rooftops equal population. And, you, and we really need to think about that and that the community, uh, the biggest complaint that I hear um, as being community and economic development is that we don't have um, enough retail for our community. We don't have anywhere for people to shop and they need to go to um, other cities in the Central Valley or they need to go to the Bay Area. But rooftops equal population which equal retail. So with that population, we will be seeing more retail come through. And really, the magic number um, from an economic development perspective is about 50,000. Once we reach that 50,000 number, we, we will see bigger retails come through um, the city. And that concludes my presentation. We're excited about the future and definitely about what 2016 will bring. OK. Well, good news about the, um, the 300 and something thousand, $325,000 uh, great work. Uh, now we'll have code enforcement Wednesday through Sunday. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Good. Mr. Freer. 
Uh, two questions. First of all, how, about how much do we get in impact fees per house? So right now it's about twenty-five thousand. If uh, without a development agreement, uh, locking in a low rate. So um, it used to be about twenty-eight thousand, but with the removal of the RTIF, the Regional Transportation Impact Fee, it brought us down to about twenty-five. Okay, and that, that's twenty-five thousand into our general fund, or does that divide it into our various enterprise funds and various? Our exactly. Water There's funds. police, fire, water, sewer, parks. You name it. There's it's a long scattered list. Scattered between. Okay. Exactly. And then the next question is. Uh, base with what we have annexed now and what's entitled now how many houses could be built uh, now without annexing any other property uh, paper lot wise um, I would say we're less than a thousand right now okay. we're eating away at that okay with the property we have annexed now mm -hmm. okay that would be that's entitled already and already mapped about with mapped, a yeah paper lots okay. so it's mapped and entitled and ready to go could Pull a permit essentially tomorrow. Now, total as far as what we have annexed now that hasn't been mapped and entitled, mm -hmm. we have an estimate about how many houses, and I guess, are one. Um, you know, the only subdivision that I can think of off top of my head that has not been mapped is Villa Barano, which um, would add maybe another uh, 500, 600 units max. Okay. So we could we can build about 1,500, 1,600 more houses. With what we have annexed now, without annexing any other, any other property. Okay, thank you, and congratulations on the grant. We can use the extra three hundred thousand dollars. Turning me off. Yeah, no, you turned me off. You're on now. Don't uh, touch no, it. No, the one comment I wanted to make, and uh, some people might be wondering, okay, we're picking up with the housing. Is this really going to get out of control again? Our system is built here at City Hall for about 100 to 125 units a year. We don't have the bodies to do more than that, even if we wanted to. So we're going to keep a very close eye on this. Um, we, you know, It's really nice to see around 100 get built. That would be fantastic because... Uh, it all helps with the retail but and, and other things. But uh, I just want everyone to know that our system here at City Hall is built for about 100 to 125. So if things really start to heat up, we're going to come back and talk some more about it. So it's not like we're going to show up one day and say, we're building 300 homes. Right. Guess, what, guess what just happened last week? You know, we're building all these homes. We just, we're not built for it. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Stacy from anyone? All right. Thank you. Let's go on to item 10, Police Department Presentation Update to Animal Control Ordinance. And uh, this is, for, is an information item with direction from the City Council on how to proceed. Uh, Commander Hedden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my presentation includes proposed changes to our current Animal Control Ordinances. Our ordinances were first adopted over 60 years ago and last updated almost 20 years ago. So it's time for some changes. We've grown in population and a group of citizens have come forward and talked to us at the, at the police department level. They've spoke at council meetings about the need to make some proposed changes to our animal control ordinances. So. That's what we're in the process of doing, but it's going to take input from the council as far as the direction that you'd like to see us uh, proceed. So what we'd like to move forward with is kind of a two-part process where I'm going to go through these talking points one by one, and I'd like the council to provide some input back to me uh, so that I can take that back to the folks I'm working with and uh, develop an ordinance that works well for Los Banos. The goals of my presentation are, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of the climate and animal control, the things that we're doing, uh, staffing, I'll, I'll be brief, I promise. And then I want to uh, pr uh, introduce the proposed ordinances, the talking points. These five talking points that you're going to hear about, these are the main points are um, the ones that were, I guess, the hot topics of, uh, of the public or the most vocal uh, group of citizens that have come forward. Uh, these are the the issues that, that they felt was important. So those are the, the main issues that I'm going to talk about. And then lastly, I'd like to gather input and direction from the council on each point. Currently in animal control, under our code enforcement umbrella, 
we have one full-time code enforcement officer, that's Jason Martin. He works typically Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. And what Jason's day consists of is primarily rent, uh, responding to animal control calls. Uh, a lot of his duties are uh, data entry and those types of things because he hasn't really had help out there at the shelter other than our volunteer staff. I'm actually pleased to announce that we're getting ready to implement a part-time animal control CSO at the shelter, so that would be very helpful. And one of our goals with that person is to establish some regular shelter hours um, so that people can come out to the shelter and uh, view dogs and those types of things. It will be tremendously helpful to Jason Martin. Our volunteers, uh, our volunteer group, the Los Banos Volunteers for Animals, uh, this is a great group. They do a lot of work for us at the shelter. And to be frankly honest with you, our operation would would uh, kind of fall apart without them because they do tremendous work uh, for us in, in adopting the animals and those types of things. And I'll talk about that when I talk about vouchers, uh, some of the things and programs that they help us do, cleaning the shelter, you name it. To talk about some statistics with animal control, Jason, I shouldn't say Jason Martin, the entire police department combined with Jason Martin responded to just over 3,000 animal calls in 2013 and 2014. And the overall goal of this ordinance is to reduce the overpopulation in town of animals. In 2012, the shelter received uh, 2,000 237 dogs and cats. In 2013, it was 2,406. And 2,398 by 2014. We are seeing that the number of animals that we're able to adopt out um, is going up. So the, the, the euthanization rate or the kill rate is going down, and that's good. And I think that part of that comes in um, with our voucher programs and the things that that we're doing in uh, combination with our volunteers. So how the voucher program works is the city typically um, gives $10,000 a, a year towards vouchers, and those are given out on a first come, first serve basis by, uh, through the city. And you can come to the lobby of the police department and fill out an application for a voucher. They're typically $20 for cats, $30 for dogs in our program. And, th and those are issued out uh, by our department. And then we talked earlier t tonight about the uh, grant that was received for over $5,000. So that will be helpful. In 2013, between the combined efforts of the Los Banos Volunteers for Animals and the police department, we issued 437 <coughs> vouchers. In 2014, we actually issued 906 vouchers between the two combined pro, uh, programs because we learned in 2013 that we weren't including the cats that the volunteers, the cat clinics that they were doing. So 906 is a, quite a significant number of vouchers uh, and spay and neuters between the two programs. Um, to give an example, a neighboring city that we did a study with, um, they issued 100 and they were breed specific to uh, pit bulls and chihuahuas, which they were having a problem with. So I'm very proud of, of our program, and I'm pleased to update you about that. Our first issue here is the breeder's permit. A breeder's permit or litter's permit is written authorization issued annually by the city, given permission to a breed, um, excuse me, to breed a dog or cat. The permit is typically valid for one year from the date of issuance and may be renewed annually. And we can look at that. There's different ways that we can write this ordinance. It could be a two-year permit, a breeder's permit. And the way that this breeder's permit works is the goal is to uh, reduce the number of unwanted animals. So with this breeder's permit, when somebody comes in to obtain a license through the city, they're going to be asked the question, is your dog uh, spay or neutered? If the, if the animal is not, then they would either have to make the choice to obtain a breeder's permit or go ahead and, and um, have the dog spayed and neutered uh, prior to the license being issued. One of the 
issues with the or one of the things with the breeders permit is um, or, um, excuse me the breeders permit is also going to help us at the at the shelter level uh, one of the ways that it works is when we get out to the shelter and we uh, Jason Martin picks up someone's animal and intakes it and the owner comes out looking for the dog they would meet with Jason and he would ask them if they if the dog spare or neutered if the dog is bare or neutered they would um, excuse me if the dog spay or neutered they would get the breeders permit at that time uh, breeders permits can result in unnecessary euthanasia of dogs and cats and uncontrolled uh, breeding part of the solution is for the dogs to be licensed or spay or neutered and regulating breeding some of the alternatives to the uh, breeders permit are the council can adopt and make no change to the ordinance or we can consider other options uh, other other options in that I'm sorry I'm not doing a good uh, job of articulating this for some reason I got nervous um, do you guys have any questions about what I've said thus far? No, keep going. You're doing fine. In the breeder from it, you? Boom. Okay. So the, another way that this breeder's permit works is when we issue the breeder's permit, we, we attach a number to that breeder's permit. And they are allowed to have one litter per year with the breeder's permit, and they're required to advertise that number when they sell the dogs or whatever they decide to do with the dogs um, so that we can enforce this thing so at this point I kind of like the council's input help me get on track here as far as any questions you have um, anything that I missed let's see the attorney has a question I have a question I just have a comment we saw a number of different ways that this was done one of the ways was if you were planning on having a litter then you had to obtain a litter permit specifically to that litter and the other other alternative like Jason was talking was actually if you had an intact I think that's a, the right word if you had a non spayed or neutered animal you'd have to have a breeders permit all of the time so there's a couple different ways you can go if you're in terms of these permitting processes you can have a permit that's litter specific if, uh, if I have a 10 year old dog that I'm not going to be breeding anytime soon I wouldn't need a breeders permit if I had a young dog that I plan on having a couple of litters I could either have a breeders permit or a litter permit so it's kind of a it's, it's a it's the same idea just a little bit different process and the way that these are enforced is when uh, the uh, owner of the dog goes to sell puppies they have to advertise the litter permit number or the breeders permit number or it's or the uh, city would key in on uh, the fact that they don't have one and then then bad things start happening to those people in terms of fines and such so there's probably when we come back with this if this is something that you want to um, uh, consider as we maybe have two different schemes for you to consider as well so and again the idea of the breeders permit is to do something to encourage people to spare and neuter their dogs uh, so that they're not a bunch of unwanted animals out there. Okay. Mrs. Stonegrove. I, I was just going to ask the, the question, but I think it's just been answered about um, when, when a citizen goes to obtain a license for their dog, then they would either have to have the animal spayed or neutered or get a breeder's permit but from my under, what I'm understanding that's one way to do it and right. another way would be to go with a litter permit correct okay okay anything else that's all I have okay. right now all right let's go to Mr. Kerrigan commander and I'm not sure if this is an easy question or a hard one because I'm getting a little tired but how do we enforce something like this where I know you have good people out there that will read this hear about it come in work you know work with the city got it and then there's also another segment of society that's going to do their own thing and you know we'll have to address that but then I'm also thinking of people that breed dogs for hunting and things because that's you know, we're 
and, and there's a lot of hunters in our community. So how do you how do you reach out to them also? I mean, how's this all work going to work? They can obtain the permit through the city by paying a nominal fee, whatever it is, um, and, and it's all again based on cost recovery model, and. They'll have the they'll have the the rights to breed those dogs, and we can we can uh, apply this a number of different ways. Um, we can apply the ordinance a number of different okay. ways. That's right. okay. I'm going to go to Mrs. Lewis and then back to Mr. Bond. Thank you. Um, I know some of our neighboring communities under the uh, uh, breeders permit if their animal if if they're caught selling animals that have not been spayed or neutered, then the the female has to be brought in as well. The mother of, of the puppies or the cats has have to be brought in has to be brought in um, so that they're either gonna obtain that license or get the mother spayed and neutered as well. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit on um, Jason's involvement when customers come in. Um, and to obtain a license. Uh, the question is, is your dog spayed or neutered? I would assume that we're going to require some sort of verification from those customers by virtue of a certificate that you get from your veterinarian to prove that that's the case. Exactly, okay. exactly. At that time they would need to show proof whether the, from their vet whether the dog was uh, altered or unaltered. And at that point, we would determine if the breeder certificate is necessary and what additional fees uh, need to be imposed at that point. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Comments? Okay, Jason, go ahead. I'm going to try uh, issue two here, reclaim fee waiver. Can I, can I stop for a second? Yes, go ahead. So, so the question here is whether the council wants uh, Jason and staff to work on language that would institute a breeder's permit. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of the idea behind these talking points. Is is Jason doesn't want to direct me or someone else to write something that the council's not interested in even considering or entertaining. So, if we could just have a sense of whether, and uh, you're not committing to anything tonight but a sense as to whether you want time spent on something like a litter permit or a breeder's permit in this uh, in this ordinance. Okay, we'll have a couple of people buzzing in. Let's do that. Jason, I'm going to interrupt you, okay? Now I've got everybody almost lining up here. Ms. Stonegrove? Oh, I just want to say that I like the idea a lot, and I would like to, to see this um, come back. But whether it's whether we do the breeder's permit or the litter permit, um, I guess I would have to learn more about each type, but I think it's def I think we should definitely be doing one or the other. Mr. Freya? Uh, personally, I think we have enough on our plate right now, legally and all the other stuff we're doing. Um, I, I don't know whether this law is going to solve the problem. You have a cultural problem, um, and you also have uh, just, just an attitude problem, I guess, with people. Um, you have a cultural problem with people who don't, that aren't responsible with their pets. And I don't think, you know, more, more legislation doesn't necessarily fix things. And I think our biggest problem is that we're too short-handed to enforce what we have, uh, as we well know. Um, and I'd rather see our money be spent rather than paying Mr. Vaughn uh, to research the law to, uh, to hire some more help uh, with uh, handling the stray dogs that people don't take care of, my own opinion. Okay. Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, my understanding of a litter permit versus a breeder permit to me would be specific to, like, people who are trying to uh, breed purebred dogs for resale. Um, I know that when I purchased my dog, I had to sign an agreement with the breeder that I would not breed my dog since it was a pet and um, that I've, you know, I had to verify that I, I did have the dog fixed. Uh, whereas the litter, I, I would assume, is just people who have desires to breed a, a, their dog, and um, maybe it's not a purebred, maybe it's a mix, but they still want to breed a dog. And I, and I may be off base on that. Um, so that that's kind of my understanding and take on that. Um, 
I, I would hope that, you know, I, I know that sometimes these new changes, since we haven't had any changes in our codes for quite some time, uh, can be a, a little bit scary for the, city, for the city. And we do have a lot of irresponsible people um, who don't do the proper thing in regards to uh, raising an animal, taking care of it, uh, making sure that it's spayed or neutered. And, you know, you'll find on the Internet all the time people who just want to breed their dog because it's cute. And then when things don't turn out the way that they want it to turn out, the dog gets dumped at the shelter or dumped out on the street. And to me, that's inhumane. So, um, but, you know, we've, we've got to find a way to remedy this problem. And, you know, also these, it'll take time for the community to adjust to this, but in time, I, I think people will begin to understand that this is what we need to do to make a healthy environment for our animals um, that people own in our community and also to control uh, different issues, problems, diseases that are out there. You know, animals that aren't cared for properly don't get their proper shots and I've spoken to several people, you know, some that work in pet <coughs> store communities who have animals that have contracted uh, communicable diseases that are deadly uh, because they didn't catch it in time. So there's there's a lot to just um, putting a new law down in a community for this. This is about health issues regarding our animal control population. And um, I, I know our volunteers do a very good job at what they do and they love the animals that they have to work with. But um, it's like anything in life when it comes to um, changes. It, it's learning to accept the change for the betterment of the whole community. So um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, Mr. Soler? Yeah, I, if we could, if it suits everybody, I, if we could go through the whole list and then come back and... You want to go through the whole list? And I, I, I really do, because I, I like for me, I think that if we're looking at costs and we're looking at everything that's involved in this, I think that, you know, can we do all five? Does it make sense to do all five? Well, hey, if we had, if you can guarantee me that we could enforce all five to 100%, then I would say, hey, great, let's sign up for all five. But for me, I'd like to see the whole list and then I would like to be able to say, for, well, you know, if, if there was one thing that we could for sure do, it's this. And maybe that helps eliminate some of our problems. And then, you know, so if, for me, if I can see the whole list and, and if everybody wants to weigh in as they go on, that's fine. I just will wait until the end and kind of give my opinion on the whole list, if I could do that. Okay. I'm just going to ask the council out of courtesy. Uh, you want to continue with this or, or you want to continue it to another meeting? Because I'm, I'm open for either suggestion. I don't know how much longer this is going to take. If you want to trudge through this tonight, we can do that. Mrs. Stonegrove. Just personally, as tired as I am, I know that there are people in the audience that have that have waited yeah. um, for a long time to get to this item, so I think that we owe it to them to at least go sure. through the presentation. Sure. Had to ask. That's just my, my opinion. Okay. Everybody else good with that? You guys want to go forward? All right, let's go. Okay, the second issue is a reclaim fee waiver and currently the city charges when your animals impounded at our shelter Jason Martins picked it up off the street if he picks up your dog and your dog spay or neutered when you come into the shelter you're gonna pay a first-time fee of $45 if your animal happens plus uh, $10 a day boarding if your animal happens to be unaltered you're gonna pay $80 uh, to Jason at that time. Now what this reclaim fee uh, waiver does is it provides a mechanism for getting people to obtain a breeder's permit or um, basically be responsible pet owners. So in, in the two scenarios, you have the one where the pet owner has been responsible, spare neutered the pet, it just happened to get out, it was a fluke, and they come in to the shelter and we we go ahead and waive the fee for them because they've done the responsible thing somebody came in the backyard whatever the issue was and they let the the dog out 
The second issue is they come to the shelter and they meet with Jason and their dog is unaltered. At that point, Jason can allow them to obtain a, the proper city license, um, obtain a breeder's permit, get the dog spayed and neutered, and at that time, he would waive those associated fees. Um, and again, this is just to uh, reduce the overpopulation of animals in our city and try to reduce that number of inhumane treatment and uh, euthanizations that we uh, go through and that we see at the shelter. And that's the, the point of the reclaim fee waiver. Some of the alternatives to the reclaim waiver, we can make no change. We can consider other options for promoting and supporting low cost spay and neutering, which I think that we're doing that in Las Benas. I think that, that we're nailing that part of it. Uh, or we can consider a, a, a voucher, I guess, if you will. So when this person comes into the shelter with their dog in the case where the dog was unintact uh, or, or not spay and neutered, what we would do is they would pay us an amount of money, whatever the established fee was for a voucher. And they'd take that voucher to go down and get the dog spay and neutered. So if the person isn't responsible and they decide, ah, I, I paid the fee and I have the voucher, but I'm not gonna take it down and get the dog spay and neutered, we're not out any money. And if we catch the dog again, those fees are gonna increase. Issue number three surrender fees for relinquishing an animal to the shelter so at this point we don't charge any fees if you want to release your animal to the shelter so if you decide that you got your puppy and it was cute and you no longer want it uh, because it turned into a big dog and it eats a lot whatever the case may be at this point you can come down to the shelter hand it to jason martin give him a little history of the dog and we'll take it, it doesn't cost you a dime what this proposed uh, ordinance would do is it would allow us to charge a surrender fee to recover some of the cost associated with the staff time and adopting the animals out. Now, there's pros and cons against this issue. You have the folks that think that uh, issuing um, or that charging this fee is going to uh, basically have somebody turn the dog loose and, and be reckless about it and animal control is going to be chasing the dog it's going to be running into traffic and then you have the other side of the coin that think that you need to be a responsible pet owner and we're going to go ahead and charge you this fee if you can't take care of your animal the alternatives again to this we can make no change to the ordinance or we consider consider other options for promotion and support of low cost spay and neutering issue number four restriction on the number of dogs and cats per individual household the way that this works is the council would establish a limitation whatever it is if it's two dogs two cats three dogs three cats whatever um, per household and the goal of that is to reduce the overpopulation of of dogs and cats in the city we've seen the horror stories uh, we've went out to houses where there's a hundred plus cats it seems like a very uh, unhealthy situation for the folks at the house and the cats and the neighbors and everybody else involved so we want to be able to um, put a stop to that in, in those types of extreme situations now we're not saying that if you have five dogs uh, that we're going to come and and take you know a couple of the dogs because we've established a um, three limit you can obtain a permit through this uh, through the city um, to maintain those dogs and then we know who you are we know where you live you've registered with us if there's complaints by the neighbors for the smell the odors those types of uh, situations we can um, come out and handle those issues there's a number of cities in the counties that have adopted or adopted or uh, implemented these types of restrictions and a lot of the cities that we study, studied um, seem to think that these are successful again we can make no change to the current ordinance we can consider an ordinance amendment that would allow for the restriction of 
number of cats uh, and dogs in a single household or consider an amendment uh, that would require a kenneling permit to set forth the standards so the kenneling permit uh, is again what i was talking about where uh, the person would come and register with the city um, and obtain uh, permission basically to have more than the uh, standard number of dogs and cats because we want those people that are the rescues and those type of organizations to be able to um, operate in town as long as they're following the rules and regulations our fifth issue regulations of feral cats the way that this this works is it's either based on a trap neuter release model and we get issue, we have issues of people calling and complaining all the time my neighbors feeding the cats the cats are congregating they're defecating in my flower beds it's unhealthy they're uh, spraying on my car so with this ordinance a caretaker or somebody that says they're not my cats they're not my responsibility I'm just feeding them this person would be required to register with the city as a caretaker of feral cats what this caretaker would have to do is feed the cats in a daily manner that doesn't allow them to leave an excess amount of food to attract rodents and and other uh, animals to to the area it also requires them to uh, regularly trap and spay and neuter uh, cats over eight weeks old have those cats uh, arranged to have those cats tested for feline leukemia or feline immune defici deficiency virus and those cats tested positive would have to be either humanely uh, euthanized or kept in an indoor facility so that they don't infect the rest of the cat population the cats that are spay and neutered or part of this program or there would be a requirement that they have their ears tipped as a mechanism to identify uh, that the cats have been spay or neutered and the caregiver would also be required to arrange for all uh, trapped cats to be vaccinated by whatever vac uh, vaccinations are required by the code at that time and again we can make no change to the ordinance or we can consider an ordinance amendment that would establish a trap neuter return program some of the other ordinances that we considered these weren't part of the five that I talked about they were uh, ordinances that staff had considered and thought would be um, nice additions to um, to the ordinance and one of them is animal waste so the animal waste ord uh, ordinance and what this does is it requires someone to carry a container or a plastic bag or something when they're out walking their dogs at our parks uh, on our rail trails uh, downtown whatever to dispose of the the waste so that it doesn't become a problem for everyone else we also want to update our vicious or dangerous dog ordinance it's currently covered under the uh, food and agriculture code and that's kind of what we've been following just because we don't we don't really have a good ordinance for dealing with vicious or dangerous dogs so we'll be updating that to model the uh, food and ag code cleaning of dog runs and prevention of flies and rodents the way that this works is it requires the accumulation of feces to be removed prior to offensive odors or flies it requires that the uh, feces be disposed of in plastic bags and in appropriate garbage containers and the overall goal is to um, minimize offensive odors and and to do that the dog runs need to be cleaned at once at least once per day uh, per the ordinance uh, vehicle confinement uh, what this one does is it allows our animal control officer or uh, our, our police officers to when they respond to these dogs or these calls where the dogs are unattended in the vehicles it requires them to or it allows them to force entry into the vehicle and get that dog out if the dog is in distress um, and they'll check to make sure that the dog's not in distress or that um, it's ventilated those types of things before they do that and lastly we want to talk about um, 
dog parks. It's kind of been the chief's goal to someday have a dog park in Los Benos. So as we're considering this, we want to um, write in the ordinances to be able to en enforce the rules of the dog park when that happens. And um, it, it would provide that the dog, that the uh, dog parks are used for walking and recreation, training, socialization of dogs. To be allowed in the dog park, the dog would have to be licensed and you must show proof, must have current vaccines and they'd have to show proof of that. Um, the dogs would have to be altered, they'd have to be over four months of age and they couldn't be priorly determined to be a nuisance animal. Okay, so at, at this point, I'm gonna go back to Council and get input. I hope I'm not buzzing through that too fast. I hope that you're understanding it and, and all of that. Okay, Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I just want to say that these, these five issues are like some of the really major issues we have here in town. And um, what the police department and our animal control department is trying to do is uh, put us in a position to allow our animal control officer to have tools. Um, I don't think they're saying that, you know, he's got to go out there and pound the pavement and hit everybody across the head with a stick and make sure that this happens today. Because, uh, you know, at some point, uh, as our fees increase for some of the violations that have been described today, um, it, allows, it allows more money for our our animal control department, which I understand is operating at a deficit right now. So in my opinion, these, these fees are kind of necessary. And last I look, um, well, which was in May, I don't know that there's been any change um, for our spayed and neutered animals uh, for a one, two, and three year license is seven, 12, and $17 for unaltered uh, one, two, and three, it's 14, 26, and 38 dollars. So it's only like a 50 percent increase, which is very low. Some of our neighboring communities, um, and uh, uh, for one, two, and three years, it's 10, 20, and 30 dollars. For unaltered, it's 100, 200, and 300 dollars. So there's a, a significant jump for you not having your animal spayed and neutered. Um, and the surrender fee in one of our neighboring communities is like $50 for a dog, for puppies, six months, it's 20, cats, 20, and kittens, uh, six months and under is 10. Uh, so the fee is pretty nominal to surrender an animal uh, based on the fact that under our current code, I think we have to keep it for three days and for the feeding and the, the staff time that it takes to care for these animals, it's, it's really not a lot of money to do that. And, and I understand that we've been having people come from other communities where their uh, departments have told them to come to Los Banos and, and leave your animal uh, because they don't do it. Um, it. It puts a burden on our city to take animals uh, from people who come from other places. So. Um, these, these are just some cost recovery issues for us to maintain and hopefully at one point to be in a position to apply for some of the grants that we are, could be eligible to get and to be able to hire another um, animal control officer. So it's, it's not just about putting restrictions on people and getting them to be responsible pet owners but it's also to help our code enforce our, our animal control department to uh, be able to, to get additional employment to operate and bring a better service to our community. So again, I don't really see these as, for me personally, a choice. I see them all as being very important, but to also assure the public and our animal control department and police department that we're not looking at trying to put an extra burden on our personnel that we have to enforce everything that's here. It's just that we haven't updated our codes for quite some time and, and we need to bring them in line with state law and uh, be uniform about some of the things that other communities are doing and things that we are ourselves are even doing better than other communities. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Mr. Silvera? Yeah, so <clears throat> back on the reclaim fee waiver, so th that's basically what you're asking for there is, is some kind of language that allows you to give them a waiver in lieu of paying the impound fee? Is, is that what, is that what, how I read that? No, on, on the, on the reclaim fee waiver. Yeah, on the, on the reclaim fee waiver. I'm sorry. Notes here. Chief? Yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the reclaim fee, fee waiver, uh, what this does is when, uh, again, when we obtain their animal into the shelter, we would waive that fee if the, on, on a first time offense if the dog had already been spayed or neutered. Gotcha. In the case where the dog had not been spayed or neutered, in that case, we would go ahead and reclaim, uh, waive those fees if they went ahead and spayed and neutered the dog. I have a simple question. The charges to spay and neuter are less than the charges to reclaim, correct? Just yes, or about the same, so you're breaking Thank you. even. Thank you. I just want to okay. Make sure. so, okay, so then uh, that makes more sense. So then if my dog's Holly, she's a little Yorkie, and she tends to like to get out once in a while. She's usually pretty good about staying around. Um, but the one time she did get out was the day my wife gave her a bath, and she didn't have her collar on with her name on it. Luckily, one of my neighbors found her. But so she gets picked up. Jason picks her up. She's been fixed. I go down there. Because she's already been fixed, I have the potential of having that fee waived. Under this code, he's going to give it to you. He's going to say, you know, accidents happen and call it a day. Okay. And then in, in the, in the, in what would happen in the proposed change? So we're asking. No, I'm, I'm sorry. You're in the proposed change. He wouldn't charge you. He would say, okay. Under the current ordinance, you're going to be charged uh, the $45 fee. Okay. And now do you see that that causes people not to pick up their animal because that fee is there? Have you ever had that where they came down there to, and it's like, well, there's $45 there. No, I'm not paying that. I'm out of here. I, I guess it's... I, I guess I'm it's, seeing a bunch of head, head shake yes out there. See, with at, at this point, we try to work with people. I think that Jason Martin, can. he's the one that makes that determination. We don't allow the volunteers to make that determination of fee waivers, but Jason's goal is to get the animal back to the owner. So if somebody comes and gives them that hard story that, hey, the dog got out, we just can't, we can't afford it right now. We, that's the reason the dog is, uh, you know, an alter. It's not spayed or neutered. He's going to, he's going to do what he can to help him out, and he does. Okay. So I'm, I'm seeing, Chet, so we're saying that's not happening out there? Okay. Well, so I, I like the idea of the reclaim fee waiver. I, I like, and I like the idea that it incentivizes people. If it's not fixed, if they're not fixed, then you would hopefully use one of the vouchers to give to them, so that it's basically they're coming out cost neutral on it, and so that would incentivize them to get their animal fixed. Because I agree, we do have a, we do have a problem with a lot of unwanted animals. The surrender fee is the one that I still have. My, a hard time wrapping my head around and for the simple reason is is I guess the honest people are going to pay the fee and I guess the, the ones that don't care turned it loose anyways and they were never going to take it down there so is, is, the, is the reason for a surrender fee is, is so that we can generate some revenue on, from those honest people to hopefully, hopefully be able to issue more vouchers for more spaying and neutering to offset some of the costs is that what we're looking is that what would you say that's the reason for that then yes that's the idea behind that to offset uh, some of the cost on that now with that there's there's you know we could also issue a hardship waiver in that case so somebody comes down and they're not able to pay for it because they're whatever they lost their job or whatever the situation may be this this particular family wants to give their dog up, they want it to go to a home, they want it to be adopted, but they can't afford it, then one of the, I, I guess the way that we can meet in the middle on the issue is that we allow a hardship waiver to be filled out at the shelter, and at that point the uh, paid staff on duty would make the determination 
um, whether whether or not to honor the hardship waiver. And it seems and, to me in those situations that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, because the reality says if they can't afford to do it and you don't take it, they're going to we're going to say, sorry, we're not going to take it. They're going to get driving the car, and they, if they can't afford to have it, anyway, then it's just going to end up and cause more staff time because now someone's going to call it in, and Jason's going to have to bring it in. Right. So, I, 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 I would I, the breeders. I guess there's two of them on here that I'm having a little bit harder time with. Is the breeders permits just because I maybe I don't understand it enough to understand how it's how it's going to work. It's in conjunction with, I guess, if your animal gets brought in. That's when you would, if, if you want it to stay natural, unaltered, there you go, um, then you would have to ask for that, bre you would have to get that breeder's permit. Otherwise, we're going to tell them to get spayed or neutered. Right. So that one there, and then. That's, that's, tell someone if I may interrupt, that's one option. Or at the, also in the, in the beginning, um, when you obtain your dog's license, you can make that choice at that point too. And we could go in the direction of the litter permit if uh, you decide not to make the choice at, the, you, yeah, at that point to spay or neuter your dog. It's young. You don't want to do it at that point. So maybe you obtain the litter permit when you're ready to uh, breed and, and have the puppies. And so that would be more specifically when you wanted to, if you wanted to have a litter, you need to have that litter permit. If we passed an ordinance that said, in the city of Las Vegas, if you're going to have a litter of puppies, you need to have a litter permit. Right. Okay. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what kind of comes with the one. I guess uh, the regulation of the feral cats. I, I I like to see more information on that. When it comes to restricting the number of dogs and cats per household, I, I would definitely need to see information that says like, like how do you come up with that? You know, uh, what four animals for? I mean, I have two dogs and a cat. That's that's a great number. I don't want any more. My wife, my wife would kill me if we had any more. But What's to say that, you know, the family next door that, you know, they want to have four dogs. There's four people. They each want their own dog. I don't know. Where do, where do we make that determination? And it is, is, it our, is it our job to make that determination? That's the one I probably would struggle with the most is that I don't, I don't want to take anybody's personal rights away. Right. And it's back to how do you regulate that? Because I think what we're going to get into is the honest people are going to be the ones that follow it and the ones that are causing a lot of our problems now are not going to follow it so that's that's what i have for it thank you thanks for the work on this and, too thank you and, and councilman if i could address that the responsible owners in that 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 uh, are, are going to get tagged or um or, or that you're saying you're going, or going to get tagged i don't think that um that that's necessarily the case what, can you repeat that again? Well, it just, I, I guess, if I had four, four dogs, I feel like I'm a pretty responsible pet owner. I make sure my dogs are taken care of and fed and all that. But if the number we come up with is now you can only have three dogs or two dogs per household, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, and I heard you guys say that it's not like something that's going to happen overnight, but I'm going to be responsible about the number I have. But the people that are causing a lot of the problems why we're even having this conversation are still going to have five dogs or seven dogs or whatever they whatever they want to do because other, unless you know we decide to get into the aerial drones and going over everybody's household and figuring out how many animals they have and I guess through attrition and calls for service you could start to find out who the bad actors are it just I guess a lot of it boils down to is how do we enforce a lot of these a lot of these rules that's the big question for me is how do you enforce it when we were already talking about we're just super ex excited because we got another code enforcement officer right. and 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 I know that uh, you know um, animal control falls under code enforcement now we're already in my opinion you know we have a hard enough time keeping up with what we have to do with the staff we have and then to add a bunch more rules and regulations um, that that would be my biggest thing matter is is how do we inf how do we enforce this and, and I don't I don't want to sit up here and give all you folks a bunch of false promises okay we're gonna pass all these ordinances and then everything's gonna be great when the reality is is if we don't have the staffing to, to support it I mean I, yeah. then to me that to me then I'm just offering you lip service and I don't want that I want I want these to be real changes if we're gonna go down this road I would like to see be real changes that I know 
that we're going to be able to enforce and we're going to be able to make a difference with? On this one, I think we're looking to be able to enforce those situations where when we get the complaint from the neighbor that this person has seven or eight dogs in the backyard and they're not cleaning, cleaning up over them, that's the, th those are the ones, that's the point when we'd be able to enforce it at, th at this point. Um, later on, when we get up to staffing and animal control, and my mind was going 100 miles a, a minute when you're talking, I'm thinking of all these things and I lost my train of thought, but our animal control officers can go door to door and do license checks and, and uh, check on the number of dogs and, and those types of things to make sure that um, we're in compliance. But again, with this ordinance, it can be written in such a way that allows for um, kenneling permits to allow people to have more than um, whatever the set number of dogs is. Okay, if that, and then that's that's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, one of the one of the ideas with the kenneling ordinance was uh, not necessarily to prohibit anyone from having a set number of animals. It was more so to apply reasonable regulations. Was, this is one of the reasons why we thought about this idea, is reasonable regulations for pet owners who have four dogs and four cats or five dogs or, or 16 cats. We just want to be able to provide them with um, regulations that make sure that the health and safety and the environment that these animals live in, the, the neighbors live in, um, are all conducive to harmony of the of the neighborhood. So, and Jason hit on it before I had a chance to talk about it. The other idea behind the killing permit is, right now we don't have a mechanism in place where if we respond out to a home based on a complaint where a pet owner has 30 or 40 cats, um, and they're and they are causing that nuisance type behavior for their neighbors. Um, we have an avenue or a tool on our tool belt now with this ordinance to allow us to affect some change to remedy that situation. So, and you're right, we get the, the resource idea. I think it's been spoken of a couple times tonight. Our soil animal control officer kind of looks at us with wide eyes going, oh my God, you're gonna pass all these ordinances and I'm gonna be responsible for doing all these things. And we've tried to assure him to the best of our ability that you're only one person, you only work eight hours a day. If these new ordinances come up and there's an opportunity to take um, some action on one of them, you're going to do less somewhere else. So there's a give and a take and all that. And we understand that um, until we get some more staffing. That's just going to be the case. But we embrace the idea of the change because it provides us more tools on the tool belt to do our jobs better in these unique situations that we don't really, really run across every day. So that's kind of the idea behind the kindling. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation again and um, thank the members of the audience that are here tonight. Um, I, I really, I think the, the first one, the British permit um, and the reclaim waiver, those are like two that I think are really the most important. Um, the surrender fee, when I first heard about it, I was skeptical, like Scott was saying, but after being presented with the research, is what I understand is that in other communities, the surrender fee has not led to more um, to people abandoning their animals more. And so if it's a way that we can generate a little bit mo you know, more money that we can um, help spay and neuter other animals, I think that's something that we should definitely um, consider doing. I also had concerns about number four because, again, if someone's got a big property and they want to have five or six dogs and they're taking care of them, um, I mean, to me that's better than them you know, being somewhere else where they're not being taken care of. But... Um, I also just want to say, because I've heard a couple times about like the issues of um, staffing and us not being able to enforce things and, and being careful to um, you know create new ordinances that we're not going to be able to enforce. I don't I don't really think that's a good excuse to not do anything um, because we have a lot of ordinances in our books. If we just look at Code enforcement, for an example, and, and the time and effort and energy we've spent in, on code enforcement in the past year, year and a half, two years, um, we're not going to catch every single person that parks their car on their lawn or that doesn't move the car from the street. But it doesn't mean that we don't have laws against that and we don't give our animal control officers and our volunteers and our police officers the tools um, that they need to be able to use 
like the chief kind of spoke to. So I think these are really, really important steps um, that we should be taking, and I, I'm really, I would be really interested in seeing um, these items come back, you know, in another meeting where we could talk about actually, um, you know, putting some of this into law. I would be interested, and I don't know if you have heard maybe from the, it seems like the volunteers that we have with, with the animals, that are with the animals every day, or um, have a wealth of information. Did you get a sense from them about um, breeders' permits versus litter permits and what they think would be more effective? We actually presented this to our animal control uh, group last week, and we didn't get a whole lot of feedback um, from, from the entire group um, as far as um, what they'd like to see as far as breeder permit versus litter, per, litter permit. But the, one that, the ones that did speak up um, did like the idea of the breeder's permit. Okay, that's kind of in my mind what I was kind of tending towards just because from my like very limited understanding that we maybe have a little bit more control with the breeder's permit that to me if someone has an unaltered animal it should be more expensive for them to have that animal than if the animal is spayed or neutered. That's just my opinion, but um, I think that would be that would be really important. Thank you. I want to thank everyone that came and stayed all night. Your stamina is phenomenal. Thank you, um, and Commander Hedden and your whole team that took on a large task. And I want to thank you for your work and effort. Just sitting here listening to everything, I don't think there's any way we're going to get this one right tonight. I think it's going to be a work in progress over time. And I don't mean a couple meetings. I mean like six months to a year. And if I'm right, you keep nodding your head. It makes me feel good when you do that. I think it's going to take two to three years before we see a reduction in the, the animal population because it's going to take that long to do the outreach, have neighbors contact us, find a way to some way to get Jason some help and I don't know if it's through grants or what but um, Jason Martin is a one-man show really right now and yes there'll be part-timers and, and we have uh, volunteers I get all that it's just you presented a lot of information to us tonight and you know I don't I want you to have some things to walk away with that's what I guess I'm going to ask the council is do you, are you giving Commander Hedden enough to, to do some work so that he can at least take one bite at this apple and then you know, we can, again, it's going to take a few meetings or, you know, time is, it's going to take time to really get this one right. But I say, I guess I want to make sure you get what you need tonight, but ultimately I want to make sure um, Jason Martin, you know, is feel comfortable doing his job every day and has, you know, the tools that he needs to do his job. So I guess I, the ultimately what I'm saying is this one's going to take a while. A lot of times we can do it in one meeting. I don't think that's the case at all. And I don't mean a meeting or two. I think we're going to be here on a regular basis until we get this thing fine-tuned and right for, for Las Panas. So do you have some direction? Do you have? A, do you feel like you got something tonight, or do you need more from them on, on a few of these items? I heard a couple of comments, but okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I, I have more comments. I don't have more comments right now. Ms. Freya has a comment. I know it's late. We've run later before. Yeah. Um, the uh, getting back as you went on, the, and, and vicious dogs, we got to deal with that. That's got to be dealt with in no uncertain terms. Um, the idea of cleanup behind yourself in the parks and whatnot, the way Canada does it is they have little stations with bags. It takes public works or um, they keep those full of pickup bags. Every park, every walk has it. And um, that you know might be an expense that would be less than some other expenses that we would have to help keep uh, cleaning up. I know. Um, and so that did the fact that those things are available and convenient, re, and, and, and they're close to a gar and you have garbage cans close by, that really does help um, on that. Also, uh, the tonight we have people here tonight. Now none of them gotten up to say anything, and I sure would like to hear what they have to say because I assume they had they have ideas and they're here because they have ideas. And we're here now. We stayed here now because you came and stayed. If you have something to say, Mayor, I would love to hear. What uh, what our constituents, what our citizens have to say here, that stayed this held held out here. So if they, I, I would love to see that. Okay, um, I have a couple more comments, and then I will happily do that. Thanks, okay. Chief. 
Do you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, maybe we could take this in the opposite direction and say, um, based on what I'm hearing, are there any of the issues or ordinances that we've discussed tonight that you are not interested in us pursuing? Because I get the impression that all of them are okay. So if there's one that you're not interested, maybe we can take it from that standpoint. And I just wanted to talk about uh, the question that came up about the breeders permit and the litter permit, and we talked about enforcement, or the question of enforcement came up. And uh, it's on the advertising, as far as we can uh, see in it right now. If any direction that we go within the breeder's um, certificate or the litter certificate, when someone advertises, whether it be on Craigslist, the Enterprise, or they're out in front of Kmart and they're advertising their animals for sale, um, our enforcement ability will come in when we walk up to them and say, can we take a look at your breeder certificate or your litter certificate? And if they don't have that, that's when we have the ability to take an enforcement action because they haven't obtained that prior to the litter coming. And it's all surrounding the idea of we're trying to reduce that pet overpopulation that we've been dealing with for years. So that's all I have. That's, yeah. an, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, let's see. Who else do we have here? Uh, Mr. Kerrigan, do you have a comment? Nope. Okay. Uh, Mr. Freer, your light's still on. Any no, more? I'm, I'm done. Okay. Now let's go to the podium. And is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a comment? The topic, sorry. A couple of topics here. A, a, a lot of topics, good ones, brought up here. But one of them that has some concern is the quantity of dogs. And I heard it, you know, I'm not saying anything wrong. I agree we've got to make sure that if we do impose laws, we're able to fulfill them without overdoing things. And uh, But I'd like to share with you right now what I'm experiencing and my neighbors are experiencing to keep you a better concept of the whole situation. If we don't, like you said, if we don't have something to act upon, then we can't act upon it. Right now, we just had some neighbors move into a house. They had bought the house right directly behind us. Great people, really nice. Unfortunately, they have about 17 dogs. And when one dog goes off, as we know, the other dog's going to go off. Multiply that by 17. Mm -hmm. I went over here to count to the kennel over here, and it sounded like the same thing. And in calling for authorities' help, I come to find out that there isn't anything that I can do except for call and complain about the barking. I had an officer invited into my yard that I invited in my yard and look over the fence. He counted 17 dogs. At that time, I still wasn't sure if I could do anything. What can be done? The only thing that can be done right now, the way we have our laws in this town, is by continually calling, making complaints, tying up resource police department over dogs barking. If we're worried about spending money on ordinances that we can that we may not be able to deal with, then we're really spending a lot of money on ordinances we don't have that we can act upon. And trust me, when you're trying to lay there in your home watching TV in the evening and you want to have your windows open or late at night when you want to be able to sleep and you can't because you've got a puppy farm in the backyard that's just going off all the time it increases your utility bills dramatically a lot and it's very annoying and I, I, I would really hate to think that one of these officers were called or his one of his officers were called out to handle a barking complaint over and over again because we don't have an ordinance and then to find out one of his associates is in dire trouble whether they're handling a dog bark because we don't have the orange. So please, yes, I agree. We want to make sure we don't have too much, but we also want to make sure, like you said, we can't act on everything right now, but if we have the tool to act upon it, if we had the tool to act upon what we have right now in my backyard, I would have some peace and solitude in my own home. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. I, I just wanted to comment on, on that particular um, issue. And, and I know in some of our, one of our neighboring communities, um, with the changing of animal control laws, it gives our animal control and police department a tool to be able to track nuisance type animals. 
And, and in this one community, when X amount of calls keep coming in, then they have the ability to remove those animals from that home and tell the owners either do something about it or they can apply for a hearing in regards to their animals to get them back or either lose them because it's showing that they're irresponsible. I'm not saying that we're at that point yet, but you know, that's, that's a lot of animals for someone to have in the backyard and to have a whole community disrupted. So, or at least a neighborhood disrupted. So, let me just finish. Uh, so, I could see at some point where as things begin to evolve with our animal control department that they can, you know, take control of a situation like that so that the neighborhood is not um, having that nuisance problem. Because that, that is totally irresponsible to have 17 dogs barking and causing a problem like that in a neighborhood. So I just wanted to make that comment because there are other communities out there that, that have stricter codes that will allow their officers to go in and deal with a situation like that. But we have to get to that point. And, and I understand you know, the, the, the trouble that you're having with something like that. I have my own troubles with other animals. And I, you know, I have to wait until these things come about in order to, to rectify some of those problems. Okay. What else from the public? Yes. Okay, so my name is Julia Stoddard. Two years ago, I started a rescue in town. Kate's Rescue for Animals, we're up to about 950 animals so far that we've saved. Pretty good job. So I have also started a program in town called Notched Just Your Average Cat. It's a TNR program. We have some funding to help with the feral cat program. I've also um, had for a while some funding to get about 100 animals fixed for $20 each for our really low income people. So we've been trying to do a lot of work towards this. There's several things um, that I have a problem with. I love the breeder's permit. I think that's awesome, especially if the money is going to be used to help, you know, keep animals spay and neutered. I think that's fabulous. The surrender fee I have a problem with, and I'm just going to throw out, I deal with a lot of animals that get dumped in this community, a lot. And we get them from the fields. I can't tell you how many animals I have right now that we start on our description on our Facebook page. This animal was found in a field. So I'm very, very concerned with surrender fees in this community. Not the Turlock, which I understand that we use as the model in, in what you've come up with. It's a different kind of community, and I think that we're going to have a lot of dumped animals. Also, if we do have a surrender fee and people are not willing to pay that, we're not going to understand the history of the animal. Often now when the animals come in because there's no surrender fee, we get some of the history of that animal. We know if they've been spare or neutered, which is, you can find that out at a vet, but you get to know about their history, and that's really helpful. When you're trying to rehome the animal, that does make a difference. Those are things that I'm concerned about, the surrender fee, the restriction. I'm concerned if we do come up with a restriction that people are going to start dumping their animals, especially aged animals. Senior animals are going to get dumped so that they can have more animals in their home. I do think that that's a concern. Um, and I'm wondering how did we decide that having a restriction on animals actually helps with overpopulation. So maybe I could come and meet with you sometime this coming week and talk about that because I'd be very interested to know about that. Um, anyway, those are some of my concerns right now about the things that we're talking about. I love the kenneling and I'm very concerned about Jason is going to be really overworked. I do really understand your view about having these laws in place, and there are people that really do take advantage of some of this stuff. Um, also, I would like to have a conversation about my fosters and how that would work. So anyway, thank you for your time. I really appreciate getting this opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes. The hour is ridiculous, but thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Hi, 
Hi, my name is Peggy Logan. I'm with Second Chance Rescue for Animals. I think I started here about a year or so ago with all of these uh, different implements of these different um, laws and standards. I went to Turlock and talked to them quite a, quite a bit about all of this. And really, the, um, the breeder's license is, is really to encourage the owner not to um, uh, breed their dog. I mean, their fines are to help people to make the decision to spade and neuter their dog. That's what the whole the whole thing behind the breeder's license is. Um, the surrender fee, I feel, is to to for owners to take responsibility, also to keep our dogs in Las Banos getting our dogs and not getting the dogs from San Anella and from Das Palace and Fireball and Chachilla uh, because they all do have a surrender fee. Chachilla and all, all of the neighboring counties do have that, and I don't see any issues. I would like to go back to Turlock and talk to some more, to talk to some more about the breeder's license. I think there's a lot of things that um, we're not sure about, and um, I think the fines are what are going to tr try to help the owner to not breed the, their pets. So I thank you for all of the work you've all done, and as a rescue, you know, you just want to see some light at this tunnel. And um, I hope we can implement some of this to help the volunteers at the shelter feel like they are getting somewhere and, and there are things are changing. We, as the Los Banos Animal Shelter, took in 200 more animals last year and Turlock took in 50 less animals. So their, their program is working and ours isn't. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes. Mr. Is Mayor, it? what we're looking at is a top to bottom review of our ordinances. Mm -hmm. Yes, the ones that we're talking about now are uh, related to pet overpopulation, but the goal of this update, we wanted to get feedback on those hot button op, uh, topics from the council, but we're going to do a top to bottom revamp of the animal control ordinance and we are taking models from turtle box and and i mean you name it that's just that's just one that was mentioned but we're looking at all kinds of cities what they're doing we're talking to these folks what's working what's not and for you guys that were shaking your heads about uh, what was going on i want to hear that i, I the, you know I, I go out and i can ride with jason martin in the truck and kind of see what's going on and get my head uh, wrapped around those things but uh, we don't know if you don't tell us, and, and we have an open door policy. You make an appointment, and and I'll talk to you. I don't care how long it takes because yeah, I'm, I'm here to work with you and resolve these issues. If if you're having a, an idea and it's something that we can implement into the program, I'm game. Chief Breezy, last comment. Uh, there's some talk about uh, other jurisdictions or municipalities that we're being compared to, and and it's fair to shoot for the stars with some of those, but I don't think it's a it's a fair assessment to, to compare us to a, um, someone like Turlock. Um, we did a side-by-side -side comparison to that agency, and unfortunately for us, I don't even think that we're in the same, um, I don't want to say in the same league because they just are so much larger. They've got so many more employees than uh, we do just working on the animal control side of it. Um, and I'm not trying to take away or say anything about our program versus theirs. We run a great program. Our volunteers are amazing. I just, it's just um, unfortunate to me when, we, when we're like a, an agency twice or three times our size, or they're making leaps and bounds and we're not. It, it's just a different situation. And I think that perspective needs to be reminded sometimes because we're not true lot. We've got one person and we run him ragged and um, we're really proud of the the work that we've done with him and the volunteers and the things that we continue to do. And we will strive to be more like Turlock. We're just not there yet. So I just want everyone to make sure that they keep that in mind as we go through this process. Okay. Have we had any time to discuss chipping of, of animals too? Repeat offenders or the chipping, the uh, location? Microchip? Hold on, hold on, let me just let me get you on here. I'm sorry. Okay. It's, it's, it's not something that we've looked in so far with this ordinance, but it is one of the things that I was looking at as part of our vicious dogs. Uh, that is something that I'd like to see written into the ordinance when you're dealing with vicious or dangerous dogs, that they be microchipped so that we can manage those and identify them quickly if they're out um, 
run at large and we know that they're associated to a, uh, a dangerous dog, but we haven't talked really about uh, microchipping. But again, this is all part of the okay. top to bottom review and I, I, I promise you we'll look at everything and, and we'll come back with a good complete ordinance. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Palmer McCoy, City of Los Angeles. So I'd like to echo what a few of you have said, but the issue I have with all the permits, all the fees, and everything else that we're talking about today is I'm going to do it because I want to be legal. You guys can throw out all the fees you want. I have five kids. My oldest is 21 or 22, something like that. The youngest is 14. We got our first dog the other day. I don't want animals because they are a pain in the butt and they cause problems. But the more permits, the more fees, the more everything else you guys throw out there, we're the ones that are going to do it. The problems that you guys are talking about, they're not going to go do it. They're not. And so you can put a, a permit out there and have a reasonable fee or a small fee, right. and they're not going to do it. And when you catch them, you can still find them. And you can make the fines exorbitant as you want to make them. But to make the fees cost more and more and more because you want to stop the overpopulation. You, if I read this slide right, you guys caught 500 cats neutered or spaded them and then released them back into my neighborhood. I don't get that at all. If there were 500 dogs, we wouldn't have released them. Now, everybody hates me, but I'm not, a, I'm not an animal person. I'm not. But why are we, if we're complaining about overpopulation, releasing these things back into the, the population, into the city, and nobody is responsible for them? He's telling me that if you release them back, if you catch them near my house and you release them back because whoever put water out, they're supposed to go get medical? Again, who's going to enforce it? I think it's ridiculous. But my concern is the fees, the permits. If you're going to do permits, you're going to do fees. Make those small. Make the fines for the people who don't do it cost 15 times more than what it is. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Lewis? Well, I just want to thank Jason and Commander Hedden for the uh, wonderful presentation tonight and Jason, our animal control officer who does an extraordinary job. Um, I, I think he has a clear understanding now that you know nobody's going to put fire underneath him and burn him to stake. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, these new animal control laws being revised in our community uh, to help with our animal control population. And um, I, I, I would hope at some point as we move down the line, not right now, that uh, education becomes a part of it too. Uh, I'm a firm believer in education and if it starts at the elementary school level to teach these kids that, uh, about caring for their animals and spading and neutering is important and making sure that they get their shots and seeing the vet. They're a strong advocate for taking the message back home to mom and dad who may not understand. So all these things are for the future. They're coming, but we're at the infant stage right now. And I just ask the public to be patient with us. And again, I, I want to thank our police department and Commander Hedden for doing such a wonderful job and presenting this to us this evening. And, and I want to let you know I fully support um, what you presented to us this evening as well. Thank you. Okay, so where are we, Council? Receive direction. That's our task. Silvera? I mean, if I read it correctly, we kind of, I think we've given direction to, to kind of move forward with. Um, you know, looking at those issues that you brought up, and and if, and, if you, and I'm a big believer, and if we're going to look at an ordinance, I I appreciate the one side or the other. Let's look at the whole thing, and uh, if it's you know 60 years old and revisited 20 years ago, if we're going to look at this thing, um, then let's let's get it up to some current standards. I mean, ultimately, there's I I actually think is it. This is this situation here. It's 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 a hot button issue. It's very people are very emotional about it, um, and what I think is is when we go down this road a little bit, that it wouldn't hurt to have a, a workshop, like a, a, a plan, a, 
planning session, or I don't know what, for lack of a better, like a workshop to where we can have, and maybe not such a formal setting here, to understand some of these folks' concerns and listen to our concerns and try to narrow down on some of this stuff. I, that's just a suggestion, but I think as far as I feel like we've kind of, as a council, I don't know if we need that in, in the form of a motion. It's not an action item. It's just for discussion purposes. But I feel like with the discussion that went on, that uh, direction has kind of been given. But I don't know. Maybe the city attorney could clarify that for me. Well, let me listen to Mr. Freer first. Then he can uh, give direction on two people. Uh, I agree, Mr. Silvera. There's obviously a need. Um, and to me, I, I don't want us to be get caught up in the minutia of legality. I want us to deal with some nuts and bolts and some stuff that can be fixed so that our, we're, we're dealing with stuff that we can actually deal with, we have the staffing to deal with, and whatever, you know, uh, Chief Breezy mentioned the, the idea of having the, this uh, breeder's permit or whatever it is. Um, if, if these are tools you need, I, I don't want us to have to get into a lot of heavy detail, legality, and then there's a lot of time. Just deal with the nuts and bolts. What's the problem? And I, I think there's, I think the council agrees with that, that we need to deal with the problem. The 17 dogs in the backyard, that's inexcusable. If we don't have an ordinance that deals with that, we need to have, we need, we need to have something to deal with that. So um, that, and if you need a motion, I'll then make that motion uh, that we ask staff to pursue uh, re Reexamination and uh, pursuit of the uh, pet, uh, the animal ordinance. You guys, good with that, Mr. Lewis. I, I think maybe, Mr. Mayor, if you can just get a consensus and ask each of us if we want to move forward with, and have staff move forward, uh, that should do it since it's just in discussion phase and not a agenda item for a motion. And I'll give you a yes. Move forward. Okay. So, so you want him to, to then come back to us with, with, based on all the discussion tonight. Do you want him to come back with a an ordinance? Are we going to continue this discussion, or do you want to, do you want staff to piece something together? Uh, I'm I'm not sure here. Mr. Freer. I'd like to see staff go ahead and work on it. I don't think we need to come back to council yet until they have. They put some kind of a skeleton. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's a, that was what my motion was. Okay. Is it Lewis? Yeah, I, I think uh, Commander Hedden had already indicated that they're going to do a top to bottom, and these were just the hot points uh, that were concerns. Uh, so I, I, you know, think that we need to just give them direction to move forward with with uh, revamping our animal control ordinance. Everybody good with that? All right. Jason, is it clear enough for you? Hey, thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate it. It's my, my first big one. Yeah. Scott's got something to say here. All right. All right, Scott. Uh, Scott. Very good job on the presentation. And so you'll have that ready for our next council meeting, right? <laughs> no, I just, I'm just, great job tonight. Thank you. Okay, audience, we will uh, let you know way ahead of time uh, when this comes back to us. And please look at the agendas. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to come back and Again, make comments at that time based on what you uh, felt uh, you needed to say tonight. If you need to say any more, we will uh, we will continue this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Well, we're close to <laughs> to uh, having the meeting go into tomorrow. All right. I can't remember the last time we were here at 11.30. I think the record was 9.30. Yeah. All right. Let's go to, let's not try and beat that. Okay. Let's go on to item 11, advisement of public notices. And Stacy, are both of you still awake? <laughs> okay. All right. Party animal. <laughs> Um, okay, so for uh, public hearing notices, uh, the first two um, are uh, just went through the design review process. That was for Sleep Train, which would be in the Stone Creek Plaza, just north of the uh, Starbucks right there. It'll be a build-up, so new construction of a 4,000 square foot retail mattress store. Um, the second is an expansion for Me Barrio, and then um, I do have two vesting tentative tract maps in a final and both of them have final development plans that will be coming before the Planning Commission. Um, they were originally named um, 
Villa Burano, which is now North Point, and then the provinces, which is now going to be South Point. The provinces had originally a tentative map um, that did expire recently. The development agreement expired um, after 10 years. So um, they are going to um, be revising that and sending that in. Uh, that public hearing will be on Wednesday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. here in the council chambers. All right. Very good. Okay, now we're looking to Mr. Kerrigan. Let's see. City Manager's report. Much. I just have one item. Um, had a very interesting meeting today. It was for about 90 minutes. It was in Merced today with all the city managers, the police chiefs, the district attorney, Caltrans, and we talked about homelessness. And I don't think that meeting had ever happened in the history of Merced County. Uh, it was a very productive meeting, and we actually agreed to meet again. So. Um, just wanted to let you know that uh, there's a lot of horsepower in that room today, and uh, it was interesting and productive, and I'm really looking forward to the next time we get together. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go on to City Council member reports. Tonight, we'll start with Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind the public to be mindful of various announcements for um, events that are going to be happening in our community over the next week and months to come. Um, and for the September 12th celebration for our fire department's 125th anniversary and the uh, movie night, it was a great event and I think the public who came really enjoyed themselves and it was nice not to have wind to have our screen blowing all over the place so that turned out really well. Uh, also sat this past Saturday, the Los Banos um, Arts Council Quilters uh, honored and saluted veterans of Los Banos who served our country by presenting them uh, beautiful quilts that were made specifically for them. Um, it, it's a real pleasure and an honor to attend that event each year and uh, uh, the quilters do an absolutely wonderful job in making this presentation. Uh, Stacy, congratulations to you and your staff for the CDBG grant application and bringing that money to Los Banos well, well deserved. Um, we were just kind of holding our breath because many times we've applied for those grants and not received the funds. So it was our time this year. And also uh, we received some additional funds for neut neut neutering and spaying animals and that was a really great uh, uh, surprise as well for me. Um, this past uh, Monday, I had the opportunity to, um, to visit and tour the uh, Golden Valley Health Centers here in Los Banos. Uh, uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer, Tony Weber, and his staff invited me to come and visit their uh, facilities. And um, the one that's on Texas Street, um, it, it covers just about every examination. They have pediatrics, they have podiatry um, once every other Saturday. They have behavioral health, which is family therapy and counseling, as well, well as their medical staff. Uh, they have about 15 to 17 staff and serve roughly on the average of 80 patients um, uh, a day at that facility. It's a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, they're in the state of remodeling and um, uh, it's, it's just a, a wonderful uh, organization to have here. They're located not just in Merced, but in Stanislaus County. And um, they take insurances of all types, and they also work with the community on a sliding scale fee if you don't have health insurance. The dental office I also visited across the street, and uh, they have three providers on staff. Um, and, you know, there was an air about that place when I walked in there that made me feel very, very comfortable. And you don't often feel that when you walk into a dentist's office. It's usually a tense situation, not maybe necessarily because of the staff, but just for the mere fact that you're in a dentist's office. But I didn't get that sense when I walked into that dental facility. It was very calming and reassuring. The staff were very pleasant. Uh, two of the doctors were on vacation, but the one that was there, just a, you know, personality, a sweet man on approach. Um, they have nine dental rooms that they serve patients. 
Um, they, they have a total of about 15 to 17 staff, and on average they serve 75 patients a day, and that's a lot of people. Uh, they do outreach to the community, mostly in the Head Start community, um, and they also take all forms of insurance and they do a sliding scale. Um, one of the things that they shared with me is that this year our state legislators passed a new law that every child has to have a dental examination at least once a year. And uh, I'm sure that the school districts are going to uh, make sure that these children are having their examinations before the school year starts. And uh, so that's, that's something that they're trying to work with in the community to help notify families that their children do have to come in for dental examinations. And their goal is, is to prevent people from having situations where they end up in the emergency room with serious medical problems as a result of their teeth, as well as educating young mothers on how to take care of their children in regards to dental from the day of birth. So um, I, I was really happy to be able to be invited to have that tour and uh, thankful that we have an organization within the city of Los Banos that provides such a wide array of services to our community. And that's my report this evening, okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Let's go to Mr. Silvera. I have nothing for tonight, thank you. Okay. Let's go to Mrs. Stonegrove. Thank you. I don't have a lot for tonight either, um, except that I attended the, the fire department's um, event on Saturday and it was a really wonderful event. I want to thank everyone that had a part in putting that on for the community. Thank you. Mr. Freya? Uh, not too much. Friday night's Los Banos Dos Palos game. Uh, old rivalry, old tradition. So if you can get out there and support the local ball players, they sure appreciate it. Uh, this weekend you got street fair. And then uh, October, first weekend of October, you got Tomato Fest. So lots to do in Los Banos. Have a great couple of weeks. Thank you. Congratulations to the fire department, 125. We'll be celebrating that again on October 7th and uh, reissuing the proclamation. Tim, you're going to bring a video. And then uh, fall cleanup, don't forget that, Saturday, September 26th, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. at, uh, where is it? At the fairgrounds, yes, the fairgrounds parking lot. And uh, very quickly, this large bag was brought back by a, uh, a person who visited Gramenta Nova, Italy. And we are an official sister city of Gramenta Nova, Italy. And there are a number of books here and plates and other things. And I'm going to present other things. And I'm going to present those to the city manager. They're now in your uh, entrusted care. And uh, you can display these, do whatever you want. And uh, these are all gifts from Gramenta Nova, our sister city, and from the mayor of uh, Gramenta Nova. Okay? And with that, if, uh, does anyone else have anything else to say? Speak now or we can leave. Okay? And I'll adjourn the meeting at 1148.